Right, so I said five past and it's five past now. Welcome everyone, uh, Kiora, and uh, thanks for joining us this morning for the workshop associated with the um, event you've just been attending for the last two days. I would have liked to have attended more, but I, I was preoccupied by uh, teaching because I'm an academic down here at the University of Otago and it's uh, peak teaching time for me. Some of the teaching involves Docker, so hopefully that means that in some ways uh, I at least have some tested qualification for leading you through this workshop today. Some things in terms of housekeeping just before we start. Uh, one point is that this session is being recorded. Um, I'm not sure if it's for quality assurance purposes. Hopefully um, it's, that's part of it, but it's for the record. And what that means is that if you want to ask questions, the questions that you say aloud or if you use your camera, that will probably end up in the Zoom recording. Mostly the recording is going to focus on the material that's being projected on the um, the screen that I've shared here that you can see. So it will mostly be terminal, uh, but just keep in mind that if you've got an issue with having your camera feed appear in videos, um, then you can uh, just turn your camera feed off in Zoom. The other point being that is in a general um, sense here, definitely I'm I'm absolutely fine with having audio um, lots of interruptions, that sounds the wrong term. If you've got a question that's desperate and for whatever reason people don't seem to be looking at the chat window, do feel free to unmute and just, you know, shout across whatever I'm saying. Uh, usually I'm, I'm an unstoppable wall of words, so it can be a useful exercise to kind of stop me talking from time to time. Today's workshop, we will alternate between you doing things and probably session the parts of the session where I talk a little bit more, uh, but I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. The other thing is I think it's a good idea if uh, hopefully you're familiar enough with Zoom to know how to use the um, indicative indicators of your status. Uh, I would like if possible for you to indicate when you have a problem by using the, um, in your participants window, you can use the little red cross and the red cross indicates um, it will just be a little badge that sticks on your name in the participants window in Zoom and that will enable us to, uh, people can open up a chat, the helpers that we have online today uh, can open up a chat session and try to help you if you're stuck with any particular point. Just to check that everyone's on the same page with respect to that, would you mind please giving me a green tick if you can if you actually have found where the green tick and the red cross is uh in the participants window of your zoom session because if i can see those uh, indicators that will help me know i've got a raised hand which is uh, that is a way of asking for help from from ben uh you can only raise hand who owns this zoom meeting why can't we <laughs> specify <laughs> other forms Raising hands, that's perfectly fine. That's a good way of getting attention. And in this case, it looks like for some reason, I think on my version of Zoom at uni, I get a whole variety of different icons, including take, I need to take a break. But unfortunately, it looks like you can only raise your hand, even if that means that you want to say you want a break. Uh, that's fine. Good. So if anyone else, we've got lots of raised hands, which is good. And of course, if you don't mind, I will ask you to lower your hands um, once you've raised them just to make sure that we don't actually think that you need help straight away but that's the mechanism that you can just if you leave your hand raised then the helpers who are online can set up a direct chat uh so zoom on linux we've discovered that you can't even raise your hand so <laughs> it's just a learning experience for everyone um i am um i don't normally use the okay but someone on linux can raise their hand well there you go you learn something about zoom I believe that it depends on the net version that we're all running and I think that the meeting will sort of downgrade some of its features depending on what the minimum version is uh, that we're operating with. But that's totally fine, we can work with raised hands, that's more than sufficient as a cue of please pay attention to me. So if you don't mind me rudely just lowering everyone's hands, um, we can reset that state of um, needing help. Good, so the other thing is that this lesson, you're going to, uh, I'm making this the idea to actually share the video afterwards. I mean, I don't mind, but what, what, what's the plan with respect to the recording that we have? Yeah, I was going to try to post the recording um, afterwards, kind of okay. like Nessie does with the workshops, but it might take a little bit of time. Sure. It's a, a bigger, bigger recording. 
oh yeah, sure, that's absolutely fine. Uh, but that's just useful to keep in mind. Why, why, not, why I say that is that if you want to follow up afterwards particular points in your own notes, you can just take, um, keep a reference of what the actual time is. So that means that then if you get a kind of multi-hour video, you can just have notes to yourself that like, oh, it happened at 11.20, you can kind of zoom forwards. And you know, we don't actually have one of those clipperboard things to kind of indicate when the recording started, um, but that hopefully can mean you can uh, keep up, um, you can connect the recording back to particular questions or areas of material you wanted to review. The other thing is that the material that I will be talking through, discussing what we're doing, you were sent a link to it. I'm going to try to guide you through that workshop material, uh, which I can show you on our shared screen here. It looks like that. Uh, this is just to describe quite why the URL is perhaps slightly unusual looking, and also some of the other kind of aspects of where this has come from. Uh, this Docker introduction was actually a lesson that I created for the research bazaar that we ran in, in Dunedin a couple of years ago. I think it was 2018, although my memory is kind of hazy. We've run that workshop a couple of times since. But what's also happened, uh, I've been involved, thanks to Nessie, uh, uh, in the software carpentries and our, more generally the carpentries workshops. And I'm an instructor through carpentries. So the, hot, the aim was always to take the lesson that we'd run and try to contribute that back to the carpentries so that software carpentries ends up with a lesson on Docker and topics to do with reproducible research heading in that direction. So that's where the lesson originally came from. But what's now happened is, of course, I've contributed my original lesson to the Carpentries Incubator, where things get developed over time. But that means the Carpentries Incubator is a bit of a work in progress. It has some to-do items and other points that aren't necessarily ready for the prime time. So I've reforked that repository back to my own private space so we can run today. Um, the point about that is that the URL I've got here, I'm intending to snapshot so that even if it's got an error that we fit, you'll be able to see what the state was when you went through today's workshop because that can be a useful compared to then discovering that we reorganize the lesson in future and all the episode numbers change and you can't find the correlation between the material that you were looking at on the web and what was in the video. So that's the aim and that's why it's a fork of my own repository that was contributed back to the Carpentries Incubator. That just explains that sort of background. Lots of really useful community improvements have been made um, since I actually kicked off making that lesson. So that's a bit of context there. Um, we've talked then about the Zoom and what you're seeing on screen. People that have just, oh good, thank you. Wonderful, you read my mind, Megan. You've just sent the Hackpad link again. We will attempt um, to be looking at this particular page here. Anyone can edit this content in your web browser. Uh, we'll be trying to look at that page to catch any bigger questions that we can type answers to and share this document after the workshop has finished. So I think that that's probably enough talking from me right in the very beginning. What I'm going to try, partly just to see whether or not it works smoothly or not, is to take you as a group of participants, and I'll just use Zoom sort of randomly assigned breakout rooms, just if you want to have a quick discussion between yourselves about some of the major issues um, that you've come across in terms of, uh, I'll put a heading here on the Hackpad document, major issues in terms of software management. Um, the types of things that you find are the really big problems, oh, and reproducibility. Oh, I can't spell that, so someone else can type reproducibility afterwards. You can edit your bullet points in here if you wish, but I'll just divide up and we'll just have a really quick discussion for a few minutes, um, say hi to each other, given that we lose the fact that we uh, can't easily do that when we're in this kind of virtual environment. Um, a few minutes of just saying what types of things you'd like to try to achieve and what types of problems you've come across in terms of managing software. Uh, and thus we can see whether or not Docker containers are gonna help you uh, solve those problems. So let's get the breakout rooms going and I will split into, we'll have four to five participants and I'll just send a message when we're gonna come back to the main room. I will be typing in the HackMD document. So if you keep that one open, that can be our kind of communication between the main room and the breakout rooms. And I will open all the rooms and feel free to go into them.
Now, though, to those of you that have just joined now are wondering why you're seeing a screen but no other people, we just quickly went into breakout rooms to discuss the sorts of issues that people have with software management and reproducibility. So that's why the main room is kind of empty, but we're soon going to bring everyone back into the main room um, and we can uh, then get on with the lesson working together. That's the aim. <laughs> Thank you. I just realized because uh, Zoom is telling me that you're of course unassigned at the moment to a breakout room and uh, thus you're just staring wondering what on earth is going on, I guess. Although hopefully you see, for some reason, I don't see my own camera anymore, but um, anyway, I'm physically here. So hopefully you can see that I am present. Welcome back, everyone. We'll just wait for Zoom to allow everyone to rejoin the room. So uh, we've got a couple of points that, well, one of the key ones, which is an excellent point added into the HackMD document, is that people sometimes request that you want to use old versions of software. And indeed, that's one of the key problems that happen with managing software. Uh, I don't know how much you've experienced this yourselves, but one of the issues you can end up getting is uh, the reproducibility of the software building process. Uh, so often you have this problem where a piece of software ends up becoming dependent on a particular version of some other piece of software. This process of dependencies exploding out all over your software systems is known as dependency hell. And it describes the difficulties of ending up actually producing true reproducible uh, software. So hopefully, um, feel free to keep adding points in the HackMD document if you wish, and also questions that were raised if, if that wasn't, um, if you had a completely serene world and there's been no major issues caused in terms of software management and reproducibility. Let's have a look though a little bit more on the practical side of today's lesson. So one of the key points, and again, uh, for those of you that joined a bit later on, Apparently we can raise hands if you're lucky, otherwise you can use the uh, chat window. Yeah, dependency hell <laughs> has commented, it's a new favorite phrase. It's, it's all very well and good as a favorite phrase until it happens to you. <laughs> it seems to happen to me quite a lot. Um, well, that's when I'm not using Docker to try to fix my problems. Um, so that phrase, by the way, is documented in the lesson materials uh, because it is actually a commonly used phrase. So you, you, anything that flies by in terms of comments that I make, pretty much everything I've said should be in the lesson material somewhere, unless I have a, a, a mental skip. Um, so let's get into looking at the software system. What, what we're doing with Zoom is if you are able to raise your hand virtually to indicate that you need help, then that's the way that the helpers can know uh, to come around and see whether or not we can fix your problems. Uh, with software. What I'm keen that we try to look at is in terms of the setup, there are a few things that uh, you're requested to set up beforehand. Many of them are optional, but the one key one, which probably isn't optional, is actually trying to get Docker installed on your computer. Now, the difficulty there is that Docker is a complicated piece of software how it fits into a given environment is, it's very heterogeneous. So it's, we have a bit of a challenge giving you even directions that we can be sure are consistent across all operating system platforms. My guess is that, well, certainly I'm running on Mac OS at the moment. I'm guessing there are people running various versions of Microsoft Windows. And we know already from the chat window, there are people running Linux as well. So for all of you, there will be slightly different experiences in terms of how you run the Docker software. But what I'm keen that we get to is um, sort of step one, if you like, of our Docker environment. We want to be able to see that um, you can actually get to uh, this particular point. And if you can't get to the point I'm going to work through, then please raise your hand and we will try to get helpers to try to help you. Be aware that we don't have an unlimited supply of helpers, so it may be difficult 
Uh, it may be that you don't get completely fast response on the help. It may be that when we have a break later on, we will come around and help you more uh, directly during that break time. So, so please, apologies if you feel like you're not being able to get immediate attention, um, but we have some resource constraints in terms of what we can do. I'm gonna swap to a terminal window on my shared screen. So this is just Mac OS. Hopefully the font size is big enough to see. Uh, and I can make it a bit bigger, um, but I'm leaving it with lots of blank space because Docker seems to like printing out very wide output from some of its commands. I have downloaded the Docker intro zip file, uh, which is mentioned on the setup instructions for this lesson. And I have unzipped that file into my desktop folder and I've got my terminal open and changed into that directory. If you can't get the zip file, that's fine. I wouldn't worry too much. You can catch up on that later. There are very few files in it. Um, it's just got these directories, basic and some. In fact, that's probably a better way of seeing the two directories, basic and some, that are inside um, this particular zip file. And you know, that's really just a little bit of starter material. You'll be able to cope if you don't actually have that installed. However, this part uh, is the, the thing which we really need to work. Now, this command is going to fail for me because I haven't started Docker, and that's going to be an example of what not to do. What I'd like, oh, okay, it does work. I did start Docker, maybe. Um, or maybe it tells me the version without actually having started the Docker desktop. Hmm. Okay, so first of all, if you can't get something like this, to appear when you type docker double dash version, then please raise your hand because that probably indicates that there's some issue uh, with the um, software installation that you have. Uh, the other command which I am going to quickly just run here to see if I get an error message. Actually, you know, I, I won't do that on this terminal, sorry. I will just start docker myself over here. On Mac OS, there's a Docker app, and when you start it, you get this little whale icon appearing up on the top here. Uh, when the containers are still jumping up and down as they are at the moment on my screen, it means that the, there's a part of the Docker system that hasn't completely started up yet. It does take a while to start up. You don't need to know this, but under the hood, what it's actually doing is, is, is starting up a Linux virtual machine under Mac OS and Windows versions uh, that will do the Docker work. You don't need to wait under Linux because you've already got a Linux machine ready to run Docker. Once I have this particular icon up and running, then I should be able to do a command, and I'm not gonna explain what the command is yet, but this is just so that we can, uh, we can change between people that need help, where the helpers can give you attention, and what I'm talking about in terms of what Docker does. I'm gonna run the PS command. Now on my system, that doesn't produce any output other than the headings of that table but it does indicate that Docker is running on my system. Okay, so if you can't get this to work in your terminal on whatever system that you're running, then please raise your hand. Um, as I've said, the directory that you're sitting in doesn't matter as much as whether or not you can get some output from Docker version, which will tell you what version you're running. And then in this case, I'm asking a particular command that will test that Docker is actually running on my system. So. If that's a problem in Zoom, raise your hand or otherwise use the chat window and we will try to give you attention. So um, other than that, I will talk a bit more then about the, ah, okay, sure. So what some people have mentioned is that some people needed to do pseudo Docker PS. Now that is fine if you don't mind having to run sudo in front of every single one of the Docker commands we'll do today, um, that should fix the problem for you. The reason is the reason that happens is because uh, Docker. Well, the the way you can fix it is there's a Unix group called Docker, and if you add your user into that group, then it means you don't need to use sudo because it means that it understands um, that it means it understands that your user ID is part of that particular Docker group. It should be allowed to run Docker when you add yourself a user to a particular group under Linux, for example, you need to start a, thank you for the command that's just been pasted. Um, that's the command which will, um, the command in, that Adrian has just posted will indicate how you can add a particular user, in that case user one, into the Docker group. Note that you need to start a new terminal before that will take effect usually. So you normally then need to start a new terminal so that you're in the Docker group. 
So I will talk a little bit more while people are just checking that we can get to that situation. Uh, the other point being, uh, sorry, just to finish off on the Linux users that had, were running sudo before Docker, uh, you can also just fix the problem by running sudo in front of every single Docker command we do today. So provided you do that, then that should also fix the problem um, that you saw there. Let's talk then a bit more, and then we can get back into more practical exercises about what Docker is and what we're kind of trying to achieve by using Docker in the first place. And this is while other people can get help getting Docker actually up, up and running. So we have, as I said, Docker is quite complicated software, but what it's trying to do is to give you an ability to run a virtual environment into which you can install software and run software. So it's kind of a clean room inside your existing computer. Now that can be extremely useful when you end up in this case where a particular version of software is required. An example of that might be say in Python or R or any of the languages or tools you might want to use. Then what happens is you could have your host computer, the normal computer you're sitting in front of, having a particular version of that software installed, but yet when you want to use some other piece of software that's been shared with you, a piece of code, you may find that you need a different version of Python, for example. Now you can try to install a different version of Python on your host computer, but if you start interacting with 10 pieces of open source software that all need different versions of Python, this gets to be really awkward and messy quite quickly. Your host computer ends up filling up with software versions. Worse still, in some cases, you'll find that those different versions of the software do not, I was wondering about religion in the chat window, I'm, I'm pleased the spell checker was <laughs> what added that into the chat. Um, what ends up happening is that you end up with some versions of software that don't even cooperate when you need to have multiple different versions installed on the same computer. So you can end up in this wedged situation where your host computer is running, say, you know, software X version Y, you also need to be running software X version Z, and you can't install version Y and version Z at the same time on the same computer. So one way you can solve that is by having a whole set of separate computers, but that gets to be extremely awkward and it's very resource expensive. It's a complete waste of energy and um, that is not the way that we really want to work. So what's happened is there's this technology which uh, some of you are already using or well have heard of, just called virtualization. And virtualization takes the notion that a computer should really just be a piece of software in terms of being able to simulate its behavior. Computers are supposed to be deterministic machines, regardless of the fact that often they don't behave like it. So the idea should be that with virtualization, you should be able to take a complete computer and run it inside your existing computer. That's essentially what Docker is doing for us. Unsurprisingly, the details are a bit more complicated than the description that I've just given in a few sentences. But what Docker is allowing you to do is to have these clean computational environments that have separated resources from your host computer and virtualization is the technology that makes that work. So the resources that you'll normally need to consider are your storage space. So where do the files go? And that's a key point in what Docker manages. Docker does a very good job of allowing you to manage the sets of files that should be seen by these little tiny virtualized computers that Docker allows you to run with their own kind of clean worlds. So Docker allows you to manage storage space and it gives you various ways in which you can do operations there that we'll see later on in the lesson. Docker will also effectively manage the CPU, the central processor of your computer, so that some of the time your CPU will be running the normal host operating system, like today I'm using Mac OS, so CPU is running Mac OS, and some of the time the CPU will be running in the world of the small virtual computer. And all of the examples we'll see today are using Linux containers. So the small virtual computers that we're running are little cut down versions of the Linux operating system that exist in their own world. The final resource that's, well actually the second final resource that's key is the RAM of your system. So you need to have memory isolation and the container systems allow that to work. So you end up with a separate pool of memory that the container uses, the Docker container uses, 
uh, rather than the memory that's being used by your host operating system. Another resource which is commonly managed is the network, and it means that, and there's an example right at the end of the lessons for, to, for today's workshop, that actually demonstrate that you can have a Docker container that creates a web server, and in this case, that web server actually serves up the lesson instructions for today's lesson. That's a little bit inception, uh, sort of recursive definition of things, but it's an example of Docker being able to serve up resources over a network connection. So that sort of puts together those pieces. If you're concerned by that and that those points don't make sense, um, then do add questions either into chat or um, you know, uh, just talk or put into the HackMD document and we will try to clean up that material. The other point is that the on a logistical front, the schedule for today doesn't say when the breaks are. Now that might imply that there are no breaks. That would be really harsh and I don't think that we can do that. Um, so the breaks, I will try to make a break occur probably sometime a bit after around 10, 15, or when we reach a logical place in the material, uh, or when you start virtually throwing things at me, and then we can just have a quick break to allow people to catch up, allow people to, um, to visit the facilities or grab tea, coffee, whatever. So I aim to do that around 10, 15. If I forget, please unmute your mic and shout at me to make sure that I remember to actually allow us to have a punctuation mark in today's lesson. But so I've described a little bit about what Docker's trying to do. That clean room environment should allow us to get closer to a notion of reproducibility of, of the work that we're working in. These clean room environments mean that you start with you know, a, a little fresh Linux system. Docker means that you can build those systems very quickly and deploy them quickly on a variety of different computers. I mean, even today, if we succeed in having Docker work on all of your computers, we've demonstrated a very wide range of different operating systems just within the group of people that are here in the workshop, and Docker can abstract across all of that. Weirdly, my camera has also stopped showing video, so I'm gonna stop video and restart it again, because I think you might be able to see me, but I can't see myself, uh, and I don't, Real? Oh no, there I am. Okay, no, it's just the Zoom changed the window layout. Okay, good. That just means that when I'm waving my hands around, uh, I can see that I'm waving my hands actually in frame rather than out of frame. That's not very important, but uh, it does make me aware of my own continuing being aliveness. So I've led us through the idea of introducing containers. That's the first of the um, content episodes in the lesson materials that we have shared with you before. So let's now get into using the Docker command line. After the Docker version instruction, one of the things that we'll try to do, and again, it doesn't matter entirely if this doesn't totally work for you, um, but it's as best if it does work for you. What we'll try to do is run the Docker login command. So can you try to do that? The login information that you need to provide to Docker isn't your user account, it's the login information for the account that you hopefully created on the Docker hub before joining this workshop. So I'm gonna just press return and see what happens. Okay, so it's prompting me for username and password. Now uh, you can enter your Docker Hub uh, login information there. If you don't have a Docker Hub account set up, um, then if someone can paste the Docker Hubs link into the chat window, that'd be great. Uh, really, it, it takes very little time to set up um, and you can do it in the break. So it's not necessarily a big deal yet. We are not gonna depend on you having logged in uh, immediately. Where can you download Docker intro? That is a um, good question. The Docker intro, that is a zip file that is linked from the lesson materials on the setup page. So just to let me allow you, allow me, sorry, to give you a link in the chat window to that. Uh, and you can see it here. This is, these are the materials in setup that uh, ideally you should have been able to um, fetch before the lesson. And the first thing underneath files to download is docker-intro.zip. Uh, and that's what I've unzipped onto my uh, desktop. So on my terminal window, I should make clear that this, this is just describing which directory I'm actually sitting in, in my computer. Um, so that's, this is the command that I'm running after my, uh, my prompt. So white text are commands actually going into my uh, prompt here. Oops. So with Docker login uh, for, there's multiple ways that you can do the login. You can log in from the command line with your credentials from the Docker hub. 
and the Docker Hub. Let me just, there we go, thank you. Brandon's already linked the Docker Hub there. That's where you can go to log in. If you've got one of these Docker desktop programs, you see me clicking on my top my menu bar for um, Docker desktop here, then you can also sign in using the Docker desktop tools. The Docker desktop is, a, is the software that's distributed for newer versions of Mac OS and Windows. You won't have that option from Linux. There'll be some other way of doing that. Uh, I'm gonna use that sign in mechanism and that allows me to, I know that my user account is uh, DME26. Uh, I have absolutely no idea what my password is because I don't remember passwords, but in another window on a different screen, I will use my password manager to allow me to find out or to copy to the clipboard what my password is. So excuse me while I do that. And assuming that I can use my clipboard properly, I can paste that in here and then sign in. I could have typed those details using the username password. I'm gonna press control C to just break that command because I didn't actually finish using the login command there. Now, if I check my login using Docker desktop, I now see that I am actually DME26, which for historical reasons is my user account name uh, on Docker. So if you're not able to follow along with this, then again, please raise your hands and people can offer help. But if I try Docker login now, I get a different message. So it's uh, knows that I've got, you know, it's used the Docker desktop credentials to know who I am, and that has successfully then logged me into the Docker hub. We will use having logged in later in the lesson. Because when we talk about Docker hub, we'll discuss the fact that the Docker hub website is a very useful thing to work with Docker, uh, but it's not a requirement. Docker can work on its own as well. And so you don't have to be logged into the hub. So going back to where we were in the lesson materials, if I can get back on my other browser window to that, we have we have started using the Docker command line. And if uh, you've got that login to work, then, okay, it looks like there aren't very many raised hands. So I'm assuming that this is all going well for people, which is great. So we can move on then uh, to further material. So now just in terms of the, um, where we are in terms of the workshop materials, I'm on what's known as lesson or episode three now, which is exploring and running containers. So we're doing um, well in terms of the timeline. Um, so that's also good. So when we come into uh, this lesson here, what we'll talk a little bit about is how Docker does some of its resource management and we will actually use Docker. So again, um, rather than just talking about an abstract, we'll get into some details here. The first command that I'm gonna run, I have to apologize slightly. This command, Docker space image space LS, is gonna be a different result for me than it is for you. If you've just installed Docker, you'll probably get an empty set there in terms of what's on your computer. In my case, I don't get an empty set because I actually use Docker a lot and I use it for a lot of different things. And what you see here on my computer, um, this COSC212 is our introductory, well, no, it's our second uh, web technologies paper at the university, which I'm teaching on at the moment. And we're using Docker to run the web servers that the students use in that uh, class. So I'm actually using Docker directly for my teaching. It means I can give every student the ability to run their own web server where they get complete control over it, but it can run on any operating system that can install Docker uh, and it isolates the web server from their own files so they can easily clean up after they've run this paper just by removing the container or removing Docker and all of the containers on their computer and then everything's cleaned up again. Uh, so on yours, you should hopefully get a list. Um, so I am oh yeah, right, sure. Okay, and other people that have already tried the Hello World example, then absolutely, you'll see the Hello World uh, image that's been loaded down there as well. So to explain a little bit what this is though, images are effectively collections of the files that sit on the hard disk of these virtual computers. That's essentially what an image is. So. If I highlight, for example, um, uh, this line here, DME26 slash COSC212-LAMP, where LAMP is referring to the web technologies, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. That here is a particular, essentially a hard disk image, a hard disk collection of all the files that need to run to build that particular lightweight Linux server. So that's what an image is. 
Docker has some very smart ways of handling images, and we'll see those as we work through the workshop today, uh, and I'll comment on those when, when there's something that's uh, of interest there, uh, of particular interest that we see as we pass by. So the image ls command, ls is you know, just the usual uh, Linux, uh, uh, Unix rather, system of saying list things, and Docker uses that throughout most of its sub commands. So we have the main Docker command, we're asking about images, and we're just listing what images are already installed on our computer, cached away, ready to use in future. So the next command I'm going to run actually does something uh, that will fetch an image. So this will require that your connection to the Docker Hub website works, but it doesn't require that you've logged in because this is a publicly available container. If I run that, then you get a little bit of output from the system and it will say that it's pulling file system layers and that it's done. Okay, what's happened here is we've requested the Docker fetch from the Docker Hub in this case, which is an online repository of Docker images, the image for the Hello World, well, sorry, the Hello World image. That's what we've requested here. Now, unsurprisingly, that means if we then say Docker image LS, then you should see uh, that we have Hello World contained in um, the list of uh, images that are downloaded. You see another piece of, uh, other pieces of information here. So it, this version was created eight months ago. How big it is, it's not very large, at least not compared to my uh, teaching containers, which are more like a gigabyte in size. Uh, and you see an image ID. Your image ID is, I think these are per computer, so I think that yours will definitely be different from mine. Often Docker uses these um, hexadecimal, which are effectively numerical identifiers for parts of the system, that's because there are some contexts where it can make sense to have multiple instances of something that has the same name on your one computer. And so then the IDs that it assigns uniquely identify a particular thing you want to talk about. Uh, in this case, there is only one Hello World image on my system, so I can unambiguously refer to it by using the repository's name, Hello World, the textual name that we would use as human beings, as opposed to the hexadecimal. Uh, well, you're free to use the hexadecimal, but that would, that would possibly make you uh, more unusual if you can remember those numbers extremely easily. So now let's get Docker to do something. Let's do Docker run Hello World. Now, if, again, raise your hand if this doesn't work, and I notice that Barbara has raised uh, her hand, so if, if there's a helper online that can provide some assistance, that would be greatly useful, and otherwise we'll come back. I'll come back if no one else can help um, before we, when we get to a break. On my system, I get this output, and again, raise your hand if something completely different happens on yours. It doesn't matter if the message is slightly different, although I'd expect the message should actually be the same for all of us. Uh, but the idea is it should present some kind of uh, positive vibe type of message here on the terminal. But quite a lot has actually happened now in what we've seen. We've ended up retrieving a software repository from an online resource, the Docker Hub by default. We've stored that on our own collection of Docker images that are contained on our computer, and we've demonstrated being able to run this particular, well, we've, we've, we've run an instance of what was created from downloading that Hello World image. When you make an actual, well, the terminology that's used is that you make a container from the image. So the image that we downloaded is a template that describes essentially the files and folders that fit within that lightweight virtual machine. When you create a container, you are creating a live instance of that lightweight virtual machine. You can create multiple live instances of that virtual machine, and they will be independent from each other. And that can be very useful for a number of tasks. Uh, certainly in, in, in my case here, you can see that if I highlight on my images, I have, we'll talk more about tags later on in this workshop, but I already have two different tags indicated here because the 
version of the container that I use in the labs that have already been, we've already given out the lab book to tell people what to do. That version is different from the version I'm using in lectures where I might have forgotten that I wanted to add an extra piece of software. And so I'm, I'm possibly using a slightly different version of that software. And also you can just generally start multiple containers from the same image in any case. So hopefully uh, the majority of you seem to be fine with having had Hello World run. The other point is that we've seen this output occur on your terminal, despite the fact that we have a wide range of different uh, operating systems. So we are seeing a version of, um, of this sort of portability and reproducibility. I mean, admittedly reproducing the Docker Hello World example is not the most earth shattering version of reproducibility, but it has created a lightweight virtual machine on all of our computers where this has worked for you to produce the output that you see displayed on that, um, on that window there. So you know, that really is um, hopefully an example of something where we're, we're making useful progress in terms of the potential for reproducibility that comes from using containers. What also happens after it finishes printing the hello world in this case is that um, the, the container is destroyed. So it, well, at least the container stops running. So it creates this lightweight virtual machine. It starts up the virtual machine. It doesn't take very long. Uh, it runs whatever that virtual machine is supposed to do, in this case, printing the hello message, and then it shuts down that virtual machine. In this case, there are different ways of running containers, uh, but that's the way that we've run it here. So the other point which you might wonder about is uh, what the deal is in terms of the word container. And the analogy is with shipping containers, because if you think about big metallic shipping containers, what they provide is a standardized way of packing things into ships, for example. Uh, <laughs> that's an excellent question, which I'll answer in a second. So the, the idea of containers is it gives you a standardized size of block that you can stack on top of each other. And you, know, you can imagine what it would have been like to load cargo ships in the days before those sorts of containers, shipping containers were invented. Um, hence, whoever invented the shipping container, and there's plenty of detail on Wikipedia if you want to know more, um, that patent would have been quite valuable for quite a while because all the specifications of the container give a standard size, the standard way in which containers fit on top of each other. That analogy is what's being made here, that we have all been able to effectively grab the hello world container, sort of shipping container idea. We've been able to create one of these things that's worked in a similar way um, for all of us across all of our different systems. Now, the question um, which uh, Oliver asked, which is a very good one, is if we have a complete virtual machine, how is it possible that we have the Hello World um, image, the kind of hard disk image, weighing in at a total of 13 kilobytes? That's extremely small. Uh, and it, the point about that is that in being a lightweight virtual computer, the, there are parts of the way, well, I don't want to go into too much detail, I guess, right here, just in case people aren't interested, but I'm certainly happy to talk more uh, in, in uh, private or in, in, in future. Essentially, the, the Linux system, the minimal system you can have, contains almost nothing on that virtual disk. A lot is already shared from the Linux machine into which the containers are actually created. So the reason Docker containers, the image files can be quite small, is they don't contain the Linux kernel. They don't actually contain the operating system itself in those images, and that's why they can be small. So in this case, the Hello World has been thoroughly optimized by Docker because I know a lot of people are going to download and run, and they're going to make containers from that particular image. Um, so that's why it's been optimized so much. But you see in my case here, something like this COSC212 image that I use as a Ubuntu um, it's based on the Ubuntu Docker container, so it's weighing in at more like a gigabyte, which is, you know, that's on the larger side of a general purpose container, uh, but it's got a fair bit of stuff actually contained within it there. So let's talk about a more general container use now. Let's try, if you want to follow with me here, Docker run Alpine. Now, in this case, uh, if you haven't used the Alpine image, then it will need to download it first. Although in this case, uh, you see that I do actually already have Alpine on my system. So in fact, it probably won't download it for me. What happens here is that we have run the Docker command to create a new Alpine container. 
Alpine is a very, very cut down version of Linux. And in this case, when we did that container run, it doesn't, it doesn't appear to have done anything. And in fact, it did do something. But the point here is that the Alpine container, or the image from which we created the Alpine container, is different in the way that it expects you to use that uh, image compared to the Hello World image. And what you're expected to do, as is contained in the lesson materials, is if you have the Docker run Alpine um, to actually create a container that does something, what this container is expecting is that you'll actually run a command inside the container. And so here, what I'm typing in, if I do it correctly, is um, this part here is the is a command that I'm actually going to be running on the Alpine Linux container that I'm going to create because of the fact I've asked Docker to create one of these containers and create a, a little lightweight virtual machine for me. So in this case, that's what I see. Hopefully you see something reasonably similar uh, to that. And this is output, the cat command, that has been produced from the inside of that Alpine image turned into a container that's running on our system. Actually, that Alpine Linux container is not running anymore because it's set up so that it runs the command that you give it and then it immediately shuts down the lightweight virtual machine. But you can see from the speed at which this all happens that compared to using a more heavyweight virtualization tool like some of the VMware products or VirtualBox or other tools like that, Docker virtual, the lightweight virtual machines start and stop extremely quickly. So that's a key point about what they can provide here. Uh, so in the case of Alpine, you, can, you don't have to only run one-shot commands. You can also get a shell, a Unix shell, that is running inside that particular, you know, inside an instance of your container. So if I run, uh, actually that's not going to work because I've, I've got the wrong command line arguments. I need to change the arguments that I give to the docker run command. Uh, great question. How do you find out how a particular image is supposed to be used? We'll look at that in, a se in very soon. The Docker Hub, for the images that come from the Docker Hub, the Docker Hub website will almost always contain usage instructions. And it's one of the strong points about the Docker ecosystem that isn't about the technology, it's more about the user support, is that the Docker Hub will typically show you how you're supposed to use a particular image apologies and sometimes I'll just talk about that as a container when I say a container on the docker hub I really mean an image on the docker hub from which you will create containers the second phrase is somewhat longer than the first so hopefully you don't mind sometimes I will be a bit ambiguous as to whether I'm talking about a container image or the container that you create from that image um, but do let me know if that's confusing because I can try to elaborate here, uh, what, what we, um, and we'll see, like I said, we'll see that example. Um, the, yeah, there will be breaks as well, and a tea break will be coming up, I think probably about 10, 15 is when I'm aiming to get to that point. We're making good progress through the material. The other point is that we make as much progress as we can through the material, uh, but you don't have to worry. We're not, gonna, it's, we're not gonna keep going for all day if it doesn't fit into the time available. The point here is that hopefully you can get started. We can offer you assistance with getting started, but also the workshop materials from today remain available as will the video. So you should be able to pick up from, from where you've reached today and complete that work. If you can't, you run into problems, I'm very happy that you get in contact with me, um, not least because I'm trying to improve this lesson as we use it uh, with the other group of people around the world that are creating this uh, lesson for the, the, the uh, carpentries. So let's change the command line options here. Uh, what I'm going to now put in, and I'm not going to explain, uh, apologies for this, I don't really like saying, and here's a magic thing that you type and it does something different, uh, but I'll talk about that more in, in future if you're interested. The dash IT is just giving some switches, the I switch and the T switch, um, that will change the way that Docker runs to allow us to run this container, but actually connect our terminal to it. So we're not running it and having its output appear, you know, because here, for example, we ran the command and then the output appeared from that container and the container went away. Here, what we're saying with these options is that we actually want to interact with that lightweight virtual machine. We want to talk to it using the keyboard so we can run a command shell, in this case, it's the simple shell SH inside that container. 
And if you do that, hopefully uh, for you, you'll get the same result that I do. We get this rather simple looking prompt here. This is a shell prompt that has been provided to us by a container created from the Alpine image. So we could run this command here. If I copy and paste that command at the terminal, that should produce the same results. Uh, and again, if you do this command, as was uh, mentioned in the chat by Oliver, it will tell you who you are. Notice here that it says you're the root user. It's very common uh, that, uh, oh, and it does work without the SH. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, so it, it sounds like you can just do this without actually putting the SH on the end. Now, you can look at why that's the case if you want to investigate in future, but it's just that the image definition for Alpine has indicated in that case that SH is the default thing that it will actually do if you don't give it some explicit command to run. So you're now interacting with this lightweight Linux machine. Now, of course, in my case, that's already quite a lot of technology in play because the prompt that you're seeing here is from Mac OS, but the prompt you're seeing here is from Linux. So I'm already crossing across to a different operating system in the comfort of my Mac OS host environment, and I'm interacting with that system. There's a bunch of commands you can run. You can have a look at what files are contained on this system, or I can look at the long version of that. So these are all the files that are contained inside. You know, these are files that came from the Alpine image. It's the hard disk contents, if you like, uh, the template from which those individual containers are created. Uh, and you see that it's preserved even the dates when uh, those, those directories were created there. I'm actually just gonna exit. So while that was all very nice for Alpine to help us with that, uh, I'm not actually going to go and interact a lot with that Alpine container. But hopefully you can appreciate already that we are seeing um, this spanning of operating systems that's uh, useful, again, in terms of working with this kind of reproducibility. You can give someone a piece of software that has to be run on Linux, and it doesn't matter that they're using Windows, you can ship that to them as a Docker container, and if they're able to install the Docker desktop, they can use your software um, using the uh, image that you share with them. So before we come up to the break, just a little bit more, what we'll discuss, and this will be a logical place to stop, is indeed answering Oliver's question from before. How do we find out what you're supposed to do with the Alpine image? You know, the Alpine, if you're making Alpine containers, how does that work? We're on the lesson now, the episode that's episode four, that says finding containers on the Docker Hub. But the Docker Hub, we had the link, I'm just gonna swap over to my web browser. Um, here, we, I can just type it here as well. I think it says hub.docker. Is it .com or .org? I guess it's .com. We'll find out soon enough when I try to click on that, uh, whether that's correct. Loading, loading, loading. Wow, the internet's very fast today from, hopefully that's not a malware site. It looks like it's the real site, so that's good. So here you see it's dumped me into my own profile page. So it's gone straight to the DME26, that's my user identifier on the Docker Hub, and it's showing you the containers that I have. Let's not look at that, because they're probably on the crazier side. Let's use the Docker Hub to search for Hello World and see whether or not we can find information about Hello World. Um, I will step through this. Feel free if you want to, to do the same, um, but this is, probably more talking, I'll just point out some points here. Uh, and of course you can explore the hub to your heart's content afterwards. As I mentioned, the hub is the type of thing that made Docker a functional ecosystem. In many cases, the technology is awesome that you get to use, but it's actually the ecosystem, the people that make it turn into something that's really useful. I think of Git as an example of that. So Git as a command line tool, it was written by Linus to manage the Linux kernel. Uh, he wasn't trying to make it particularly user-friendly because he, he had a particular purpose for using it. GitHub has turned the Git tool into a complete ecosystem, a transformative one. And I think the Docker Hub has also uh, made that a similar sort of impact in terms of using containers. Anyway, let's look at Hello World. Updated a day ago, well, there you go. Maybe already my, uh, the output that I put into the lesson may be wrong because that may have been updated. I'm clicking on that Hello World example, and this will give you a fairly standard layout to the page. So all the Docker Hub pages will have the material that's at the top here. Um, the first kind of chunk of material will be fairly similar. These are provided by the Docker website as well, the description, reviews, and tags. 
what you see is you see the name of the hub up here. You'll see some attestations. So in this case, it's indicating that this image is a Docker official image. Now, why that's important is because you want to know where your Docker images come from. There is a malware risk if you're running images. You know, if you run a Docker container created from an image and you use the commands we'll discuss later on in the workshop that allow you to share all of your host computer's files with that particular container, if the container is malicious, it can, you know, take your, you know, nick your files or delete them or whatever. You would need to have explicitly set up sharing and under the Windows and Mac OS Docker desktop, Docker will ask and say, Docker wants permission to access files in, you know, some location. So you will get some warning as to what you're doing. But it is worth keeping in mind that there are some security implications to using Docker, uh, particularly when it comes to sharing files between your host file system and the lightweight virtual machines. But that's why you can assume that Docker official images are safe to use without really thinking about it very much. And it says a little description. It's an example of um, the Hello World. And it also says it's an example of minimal Dockerization. So that's more talking to uh, developers who are interested in seeing why it's the case that the Hello World image is so small. So I'm going to just scroll down a bit. We'll talk about uh, tags a bit more later on, but you get the general, I mean, you, you know what the word tag means. So in Docker, there are different ways in which um, you have um, the different tags will indicate um, different sort of subversions of a particular container image. You saw that when looking at the um, example for the COSC 212 course that I'm teaching at Otago, where I had different versions for the lab exercise ones for the students versus the version that I was using for lectures. Of course, they're public, so students are very welcome to use the version I'm using for lectures. That's completely up to them. Uh, so, yes, good. So in terms of this hub you see here, you've got some tags and it will give you some example. If I scroll down here, it's showing you this is how you use it. So this is this is sort of helping answer the question uh, that Oliver chatted, uh, that Oliver put before in the chat window. How do you find out about what's actually you're supposed to do is you can use these Docker Hub pages. Now that's the Hello World example. Let's look at Alpine uh, because that was specifically the one we were talking about. Uh, Alpine is here. You notice that actually I, oh, it is actually a Docker official image. I wasn't sure about that. Uh, so it's based on Alpine Linux, uh, complete package index, and only five megabytes in size. So again, even then, that is, is very impressive. The download counts shown here, so that's had a billion downloads, which gives you some idea of how much Docker gets used. Um, the other point is it tells you which different architectures this uh, container image supports. So in this case, you can run it on a variety of different types of systems. So old 386 systems, if you want, uh, also newer ARM-based um, CPU types. Uh, Alpine Linux is also compiled to be able to run on those. In many contexts, you don't have to care about architecture because uh, the Docker commands will try to do something sensible, uh, loading the correct container for your particular architecture. So if we scroll down here, it says, what is Alpine Linux? And then it gives you some examples of usage. So uh, some chat messages talked about the entry points. We'll talk more about these uh, Docker configurations and files later on, uh, but it gives you some documentation of how to work with um, this particular type of software. If we look for Python, coming back to our example of uh, content where you might have the challenge of having different versions of software being required, then Python is again a Docker official image, so it's, it's a managed and safe image to use. And if you scroll down, there's lots of different tags here, because remember, that's what we mentioned before, that uh, you can ask for specific versions of software. So these are all the different versions of software in the tags that you can choose to download, uh, and you'll get a particular release of Python. If we keep scrolling down, then it will, in this case, give you a whole bunch of information, including commands like this that say, okay, that's how you would run a simple Python script when you've downloaded Python using this image from the Docker Hub. Uh, and it also tells you why they have the different tags that they're using, what those different versions are, and what the implications are. So it's quite common to have a version of containers that might have a slim version, less functionality, but it's smaller. So perhaps if you're not using certain functionality, 
um, as it says here, this image does not contain um, the common packages contained within the default tag and only contains minimal Python packages. So that might work in your context. You can minimize uh, your container images if you know how to throw away the software you don't need to use. Just very briefly then, if we um, hop over to examples where uh, I have content, you're very welcome to use these containers, but I have to admit mine are not particularly well documented uh, because they're mostly just used by me in this context. Uh, if you find them useful, then definitely let me know because I can put more documentation in. The two of the ones which are most common in my use at the moment is uh, this top one here, which is the, um, uh, so if I click on that first link on my shared screen, this is the in fact, I didn't create all of this container. I, as I've, I've indicated, it's thanks to someone who's already created a Docker lab stack you know, with a web server and all the things I needed for the paper that I'm teaching. So very much thanks uh, to Matt Rayner, but Matt Rayner released the specification for creating his container image open source. So I am able to use that and build on it. And so I have customized this particular version of his web server environment to suit the teaching needs that I have uh, at university. Likewise, if I go back to the profile page and show you one of the other ones that I use, um, that you can also use as well. This is if you use the LaTeX system for typesetting and building PDFs, I have a Docker container that I've created here, uh, which is a bit larger than some of the other containers just because LaTeX ends up making bigger files. I've not documented this one, so apologies for that, but I actually use this uh, if you're interested, you don't need to know what this means, but I use it in continuous integration. So I have some cases where if I check in some content to a Git repository, then the PDF document that that's, that, that content is specifying will be automatically produced. And I use a Docker container to actually build the LaTeX document from the files using what's called a continuous integration pipeline. We refer to that right near the end of the lesson materials, but we might not get to that today. Um, but again, I'm happy to talk about that more if you're interested. So I think that this has reached a reasonable place for us just to have a quick break. Uh, I'd say let's take about a 10 minute break. So that brings us back to 10.20. We can start up again uh, with the lessons, but I'll be online in the meantime. Uh, so do just, if you've got any particular questions or if you run into problems that haven't been fixed yet, things that you've held off on, uh, then let me know during the break. And otherwise we can continue working through the material at 20 past 10. So see you then. Good, welcome back, uh, assuming that you are back. And we will continue on after having had a break where, for whatever reason, I haven't actually moved from my chair. Actually, I'm just gonna quickly check whether or not, no, okay, that's all good. I just, one of the many things I wasn't looking at was um, email. So I just thought I'd just check in case anyone was unable to reach the workshop and wanted to get in contact via email, or I think, uh, that, that Megan and the others at Nessie are handling that. So I've been just doing a bit of uh, interaction through the HackMD page, as you'll see there, um, talking about some experiences with um, the responses that you gave in terms of the major issues, the software management and reproducibility to begin with. Right, so where we got to, we talked about the Docker Hub, and I showed you some web pages there. One of the things that is key that I didn't mention, well, as in, I think you, you probably guess it anyway, but it is something which I'll just mention, is that the tags that we talked about for tagging different versions. So for example, here, my LaTeX builder, I have um, two tags that I've uh, released. By default, if you don't mention a tag, then the convention is that latest is the name of the tag that you get. Okay, so you, if you don't put in a tag, then Docker will just put latest because that's the idea that you're always trying to kind of pull the most recent version of whatever the container image was uh, or use the most recent version. For reproducibility, you probably don't want to do that. You probably want to pick a particular version and stick with it because when you change that version, you may need to alter the way that your software process actually runs. And that's one of the things that I did on the LaTeX builder because I'd realized that uh, some other people were actually using it because you know, it's, it's all open source. So a number of people had been downloading this image. 
but I hadn't touched it for about three years. So I, was, I thought, well, okay, maybe latest isn't the best description anymore. I should actually rebuild my LaTeX builder image to use a more recent operating system because I hadn't been tracking things like operating system security updates because of one of the points of containers providing you a reasonable amount of isolation. I mean, I wouldn't advocate, despite the fact I'm almost just saying it straight into a recording of a um, workshop, but I wouldn't advocate running insecure, unpatched software. But there are some contexts where you can start up a Docker container that's running software that might actually have security vulnerabilities, and it may just not matter at all. Because if that container is never interacting with the network or any malicious sources of files, well, and it, you know, it, it probably doesn't really matter that it's actually an older version of the software that might have security problems. Uh, I don't think security info sec type people would probably really like me encouraging that, uh, but it is the case why, say, in the case of my LaTeX builder environment, people might have been using quite old versions of that software, and it's unlikely to create a security risk for them uh, unless they've done something very strange with using it. Anyway, so I made a new version of that, and I updated it, as it says here on the page, 21 days ago, apparently. Uh, I created a new version that was built on uh, an updated version of the, the underlying Linux operating system. Other than that, it's exactly the same, um, the same software that's being installed. But that created, that means that my tag now, when I remember, I will go back and upgrade the operating system. The tag that I put here, stretch, is actually a name of a Debian Linux release. And so this is the this is mentioning the fact that I'd used in the really old version, Debian Stretch Slim, a cut down version of Debian uh, to install the LaTeX builder previously. So if people did really want to keep exactly what I'd had before, they can use an explicit mention of Stretch Slim as the tag name for DME26 slash LaTeX builder. The other point about the naming is that if you're not using a, an official container like Hello World, if it's your container, the convention is that you put your username with a forward slash between them. So in this case, the convention is that the name of containers that I share publicly on the Docker Hub have my username, DME26, followed by a slash, and then whatever I've called that container. So that's enough about, I think, talking about the Docker Hub, if you're all happy with that. Uh, we can go into a bit more information about managing containers. One of the things is I've talked about how we can create them. I haven't talked about how we can remove them. And, you know, that's something we should definitely cover for the sake of you being able to manage the complete life cycle of resources that you've acquired from particularly the Docker Hub. So let me swap back to the terminal window. We now have an extra amount of stuff that's been accumulated. We, if we have Docker image LS, then we can see that we have both the Hello World and the Alpine images uh, that are now um, stored locally on your system. Now, let's say that we don't want Hello World because, you know, we're desperate to reclaim the 13 kilobytes of space that it's occupying on our computer. We want to remove it. Now, many of the Docker commands will let you try to use a name, but the unambiguous way to refer to something is by its uh, hexadecimal ID. So in this case, I'm going to say Docker, no, I'm not, I'm not going to type correctly, Docker image RM, which is remove. And we can say, I'm going to copy and paste this image ID. And you are very welcome to try to do the same thing, but you are going to have to find your own image IDs. Or someone can confirm to me if your image IDs are the same as mine. Uh, right. Ah, interesting question. Yes. Okay, I'll come back to that. So someone asking about Windows images, that is much more complicated. Docker runs on Linux kernels, usually. There is a Windows variant, uh, but it's more new. And apart from the fact I just mentioned it then, I'm probably intending not to talk about Windows containers for the rest of the time here. Often when people use Docker on Windows, they will be still using Linux containers, Linux images that run on the Windows host computer. Uh, so yeah, I'll come back to that, uh, Jade. It's a good question. And I think that you have a particular use case in mind. So we, we might also talk afterwards about how to help with that use case. Trying to remove this hello world image, let me do that, and it doesn't work. That is intended, and it explains that in the uh, resource material. So <laughs> these sorts of error messages can be unpacked to read the semantics of exactly what it's getting at. The point that's important here is at the end, and we will dig into this in more detail. It says, 
image is being used by stopped container some other numerical ID. Okay, well, you immediately see that that ID is not contained in the list of images, so something else is going on here. Now, if we look at which containers are running on our system, we can do that by using the command docker container, because it's the subcommand container, and we can ask for ls, list docker containers. That is the instances that are actively running in our system. Right now, that's nothing because we're actually not, we're currently not using any Docker containers. So there isn't anything that's up and running. If you opened up one of those interactive Alpine containers in a different window and asked Docker container LS, then you would see your Alpine container listed here because it would still be running. But we've been given the hint as to what's going on because it doesn't just say container, it says stopped container. And what happened was when we ran Hello World, Hello World created a container, ran the container, that container then stopped, but it didn't get automatically removed. Actually, what happens is that, and you don't need to know this, so you can close your ears if you don't want to know the details, but actually the image that you download, when you create a live container, it actually creates a new layer of that image above the existing image. Now that new layer of the image only stores the differences between that layer and the layer beneath it. But because it depends on the layer beneath it, it means you can't remove the layer beneath it, the image, because you would destroy that dependency. It would mean that all of the files that were created by the particular instances that you created with um, the docker run command wouldn't be able to work anymore. So that's why the existence of a container that ran in the past is stopping us from being able to delete the image because of the fact that this stopped container that's shut down the virtual machine, this one still is depending on the contents of that image file. So we can fix that by looking for not just the containers that are running, uh, but we can ask to look for, we put double dash and then all, and that will list all of the containers that have stopped recently. And indeed the status column here you see that even with me making a really wide window, it still wasn't wide enough for the docker container ls command. So I apologize for the fact that this is wrapping the lines a bit awkwardly. But you see here, the container ID is mixed between, um, well, that's, that's these lines. It's not the other lines that aren't highlighted. It's those numerical IDs. You see the image, which described what that container was created, essentially on top of that image, what command was run, when it was created, so we see the ones that we've run this morning, as opposed to say the ones which I have used reasonably recently um, in my teaching, which was a container that I ran and it sort of closed down some time ago. And then you see these names that uh, Docker just creates sort of human readable names as an alternative to these container IDs. So that's not me naming things in creative ways, that's just Docker coming up with names for these containers. So um, we can see then that what's stopping us from removing the hello world image is this line. So this line here was when we ran hello world apparently about 43 minutes ago, that printed hello world it then stopped running that container, uh, but it's still dependent on that container's image there. So what we can do is we can uh, keep it clean by removing that particular container. And if we type docker container, uh, RM. We're now removing the container rather than the image, and I'm not going to remember how to type the hello world uh, container ID. I'm just going to use the clipboard and copy and paste that. So it helpfully echoes back the container ID that it was successfully able to remove in that case. So if we rerun this command, which I won't do here, but you can feel free to do so, you will now not see that hello world uh, container listed as a stopped container anymore. What that hopefully should now mean is that if we now go docker image remove, and here I'm not going to use the numerical ID, I'm going to use the human readable name because that's unique, it's sufficiently unique for docker to do something unambiguous. That won't work because I can't type. If I press control A and control T to swap those two letters and try again, now it's actually done what we needed. So you notice that it does a couple of extra steps. Uh, the key points here are these two lines. It actually deleted some content. What you're seeing there is 
that the image, which it's deleted, was in fact itself made up of two layers. And Docker efficiently manages distribution of the contents of images. Remember, that's the hard disk content, effectively, the files and folders inside those lightweight virtual machines. Docker has ways of meaning that it understands layering, which means that if you build 10 different containers, but they're all on, they're all based on the same Ubuntu Linux image, then Docker will not store multiple copies of that Linux image. It will share that and sensibly use it across all of your other containers. So that's one of the ways that Docker saves resources. It doesn't require that every single container has its own complete storage of every part of all the files and folders. Docker will make sure that those files and folders are preserved correctly because the different image layers are actually read only, uh, but it can fetch them and cache them locally and they can accelerate operations for you when you then use that content again in future. So, because it already has a locally cached copy. So in this case, we've removed that image. There is also a command that's discussed in the resources that I won't show here because I don't actually want to run it in this context, which is there's a command called prune, which would just remove all of the stopped containers uh, and their, their images. Um, sorry, the stopped containers can be removed by that particular command. Uh, but as I said, I don't want to run it here. And in, in your case, it, it's probably fine to go through and manually choose those containers that you want to remove. So we've now shown how you can manage um, the cleaning up of that container material. So now let's talk a bit about creating your own containers. So and when I say that, it's, I actually mean creating your own container images from which you could then create containers or you can share your container images to someone else, a collaborator, and they can create containers from your container images as well. We'll start with some simpler examples and then we'll kind of go into more detail. One thing which I'm not exactly sure of again is precisely when you might want to have the next break. Uh, I guess that, you know, heading on for at least a sort of hour's worth of time probably makes sense and that maybe 11.30 would be a reasonable time to have a break. Um, but uh, my momentum doesn't need to define when you want breaks. So please do just say chat when you're getting to the point where you feel that it's time to have another mental digestion break uh, or any other form of break. Um, and we can find a place to stop and then continue with the rest of the lesson where we reach. I'm now, in terms of the lesson materials, on what's referred to as episode five, which is creating your own container images. So that's what we're working through here. What we'll look at now is creating um, a container image that adds in some software that we want to use. So let's start by having a look at what we might want to do with Alpine Linux also containing Python. So let's see how this works. If I start up a, and you can do the same, absolutely, uh, an Alpine, Lin oh, in fact, I know now that I don't have to type SH because I've, thanks to the chat window, I've been told that this should give us a shell if we ask for the Docker run command to open an interactive connection to that shell. So I have got a shell. Excellent, we're now running I'm now typing and reading and writing the input and output from our Alpine Linux container. If I type Python, if I can type Python, if I type Python and press return, Python's not found. Okay, Python is not installed by default in Alpine. That's not surprising because if you remember the Alpine image is five megabytes, you can't fit Python in five megabytes. It's much bigger than that, even the slim versions. But it turns out Alpine it's designed to be very small, but it's not designed to be non-extensible. Alpine is designed to be extensible. So you can install Python into Alpine. So we can do that interactively using the command that again is covered in the resources for this workshop, but I'll just type it manually. Um, this is the APK is the Alpine package K. I don't know what K stands for. Maybe K is the K in package. Doesn't really matter, I guess. It's just the command that adds packages into Alpine. And we can say add, that's apparently what we want to do, double dash update, which means it will check whether or not there are newer versions of the software. And we can then give a list of things, the, the, the Alpine packages, and this is named by Alpine. So it turns out that the Alpine name for the Python package is Python, which is a good thing. That's a very logical choice of name, but it didn't have to be that. These names are chosen by the Alpine Linux team when they're building their packages. 
But it turns out we can, we can type uh, that we want to install Python. That's not all. We might also want to say install uh, PyPip, which is the name in the Alpine repository for the um, PIP Python software management system, which can mean Python can install extra packages. Uh, and then maybe we want to also say Python dev, and that's sort of development environment um, for uh, Python. And we'll see why in a second, why we do that. So I'll try to run that command now. Uh, shout if this ends up scrolling off the screen before you're able to do the same. It, it might actually scroll off the screen this time, but that's fine. Just uh, raise hand or actually just mention in the chat window and I can paste it into the HackMD document or you can retrieve it from the lesson materials. So let's run this command and see what happens. Okay, it does some internet stuff, loading, loading, loading across my terminal window. I'm presuming that's going to finish reasonably quickly. And we're done. Okay, so it's shown us that our request to install those particular pieces of software in the Alpine world has installed these other dependencies as well. So there are some things like the SQLite, I'm not quite sure exactly which bit of Python relies on a database engine, but there you go. Um, some part of what we did here, oh, actually it might, well, it might be the package manager that might use this database engine here. Um, anyway, whatever it is, it's figured out what we needed to install to make this work. So if we can now try Python double dash version, then hopefully you should see what I see. Um, oh, really, unsatisfiable constraints. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. So I wonder why your Alpine is different from mine. Okay, that well, look, maybe that changed yesterday. So one of the problems that I have is that, of course, the Alpine that I'm running was already on my computer. So it may well be that there's a new version, uh, even of the way that Alpine works, or something's gone temporarily wrong that's completely broken that example. So <laughs> that's a bit unfortunate. Let's see what we can do about that. So I think that, so Python 3, which version of 3.9 is the one that we have? Is that the, let me quit out of this. I'm going to exit from here. Let's see whether or not we can actually get some reproducibility happening here. Um, so again, inside what I think might have happened, the Docker image LS, no, oh, okay. So I'm using so I'm using the Python as it's tagged being latest, but I think the problem here is that there may have literally been a change in Alpine. All right, but that's that's fine. Let's see if we can diagnose this because it would be quite nice to be able to have the Alpine example work, mostly because some of the um, the the exercises we want to go through later actually reuse that. So what I'm going to try to do is I'll try to guess. Uh, I'm just having a quick look over here in a different window. If I look in the, in what's happened, so Alpine was updated a day ago, and I think that that may be a problem. <laughs> so I think it may be that the update of Alpine has broken all of the examples, but I think that we will simply, yeah, I'm probably going to get this wrong a few times, so you'll have to remind me, that in our case, let's see whether or not this works if we don't use Alpine latest. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's run the same command, but we will go Alpine, and I'll put a colon, and I'm going to guess that 3.9 is going to fix our problem. So let's see whether it does. It's unable to find that particular tagged version of Alpine, so it's going to load it, blah, 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 extracting. And now let's see whether or not this is happier. So I'm going to just copy the command here, and I'm going to paste it in here and hopefully this will work in a similar way. Blah, 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 blah. And now if I, well, I mean, it worked for me anyway. So what um, is important is whether it works for you. So can someone tell me whether or not you were able to have this? Yeah, okay, fine, good. Right, well, there you go. That's a practical version of reproducibility. <laughs> also, where the major version of Alpine changed in between me testing this exercise and us doing the workshop. But anyway, docker to the rescue. What's going to go wrong is I'm probably going to forget to put colon 3.9 at the end of something that has Alpine in it sometime in the rest of the workshop. So you can virtually throw something at me, scream across Zoom saying, Dave, you've forgotten the colon 3.9. 
That means the workshop material is not quite right, but it means that I know we have something to change. Um, oh yeah, sure, and I absolutely completely agree. The Python 2 is end of use, I mean, end of life and you know, moving forwards. The thing here is that um, we just haven't updated the exercises for Python 3. Totally happy to do that. We will do that as our way of fixing this particular problem. It is still the case though that Docker, as we can see here, can facilitate using end of life code. And one of the things that I feel very strongly about, particularly when you consider the really problematic sort of disposable hardware type dynamic that exists in much modern computing, it's insane that we have these computers that are perfectly capable of doing useful work, but we can't use them anymore because of software problems. That just drives me nuts. It's like, how can we be just creating landfill filled with heavy metals and all sorts of really difficult to recycle stuff um, in these, you know, when, when, when these machines can still actually work and do useful things for us. And Docker can help with that. It does mean that if you have software that's not being maintained anymore that really does depend on Python 2.7, like our workshop instructions, then you can use them by having Docker kind of fix that version problem. Right, okay, so now that we're kind of back semi on track, what this could explode because of course other things may depend on, well, it may depend on the workshop exercises just being updated, but let's give it a go and see what happens. We'll install Siphon, I don't know how you even say that, and just see whether this actually works. It's not important because we're not going to use it, so hopefully it does work, but um, it's a demonstration of using the pip tool to install uh, another library into the Python system. So Cython is, um, it, it's, it's got to do with interacting between Python and C libraries, uh, and it's just an example of using the pip Python package management system to get Cython up and running now in this environment. So we did those steps manually. Now, I mean, sure, you could tell your collaborators, here's what you need to do. You know, you need to do Docker run, IT, Alpine, colon, 3.9, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> Hillary's asked a great question. That's a very good question. Does this interactively installed stuff stay installed once the container is stopped? Um, yes, it does but it's only in that particular instance it gets it still stays around in the stopped temporary image that's built on top of the image that you use however if you ran docker run if you ran this command a second time well actually that's what i was about to show next so it's a good question it does stay buried away but it's 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 not the common way to work to do this interactive installation and then use the fact that there are some ways of actually getting access to the files and folders that changed. Normally you want to explicitly run this workflow of scripts, uh, but that's an excellent question. And in fact, it preempts what I was gonna do next. So if I exit from this Alpine environment and we run, I'm just gonna use up arrow in my shell to run the same command again, because we won't need to download 3.9 now because we have it cached locally. Uh, if we run in this shell, Python version, you can probably guess what's going to happen. We've created a new instance of the container from that Alpine image. The Alpine image doesn't have Python in it. So in this case, if we use Docker run to create a new container, we're making a new throwaway image layer into which we haven't yet installed Python. So we haven't, we haven't got that Python installation there. This is getting a little bit more advanced, um, if, if, if you don't mind. So again, close your ears if you're not interested to know. But if we actually have a look at the dockage, Docker image LS, um, then here you will see, actually it's a bit more detailed than that, sorry. If we say docker container um, ls dash dash all, that's actually what I meant to run in this case. What you will find is that the older one here, the 46 seconds ago one, has actually probably kept or, uh, a version of that, that uh, the files and folders that did include us having installed Python. But that's not the way that you normally distribute your new, if you're only doing a small number of changes, particularly if you're sharing material where other developers or other collaborators, other researchers might want to tweak what you did, then it's more useful to them to have what's called a Docker file, which is a description of how you build the container into the state that you actually want. So, and that's what's normally the way of, of working. Strictly speaking, we could actually ferret around in the system, find where we got to with the interactive installation, tag that, 
and then push that image as just a chunk of files and folders to the Docker Hub. That is technically possible, uh, but you might well have people tell you that it's not possible. They might kind of say, wow, you've lost Python because we exited that container and it went away. I mean, what they're saying is the Docker file mechanism, what they mean to say is the Docker file mechanism is the better way to work, um, but you can actually get access to that image which is installed in those interactive sessions until, for example, you use the prune command or you otherwise go through and remove containers that are stopped. Uh, it turns out there is a way to restart that container, uh, but that's different from the docker run command. I mean, it won't surprise you that it's actually the docker start command, but we won't explore that because that's not the common workflow that people use. Now we're sitting, or hopefully you're sitting somewhere, I'm going to show the working directory. I'm in my home directory, um, sitting in this docker intro folder that I unzipped from the zip file that we talked about earlier. Now the zip file only provides a very small amount of starter material. So if you haven't been able to get the zip file, you can probably just type this stuff in or um, you know, quickly enough, or we can copy and paste it. Uh, and it's also in the lesson materials as well. Um, so shout on chat if it's not working for you. But otherwise, if I LS what we have here, there's two folders, basic and sum, and they just contain, in this case, both text files, which are Docker file starter material. They're not valid Docker files. We need to fill in the Docker files to make them valid Docker files. Uh, but there's only four lines of content. So you may well just be able to quickly type that in, even if you don't have that structure. As you would guess, we are forming a scaffolding for where we want to take the lesson in future, where we might put more complicated examples here as well. Um, so for the moment, I'm going to CD into the uh, basic folder here. So that means you should be hopefully somewhere similar under your desktop Docker intro basic. Or if you can't do that, you can just create a temporary folder that you can change into and create uh, the Docker file there. If we LS here, we have just a Docker file. I'll use the cat command to show the contents of this Docker file. Remembering this is not a valid Docker file, it's just showing us what we're going to fill in. What's not valid is uh, these parts between the angle brackets. That's where we need to actually put in some content of our own. These are valid commands to put into a Docker file, and we'll talk through what we're doing there. And I'll try to make sure that when I've done this Docker file, I will leave it on screen and probably just paste it into the HackMD uh, window um, to leave it around for you to use as well. And in fact, one of the other things which I'll do just to complicate my life slightly more, I have the HackMD document opened over here, which is all well and good. Um, uh, but I will also open it in another window so that I can have a window that isn't this one, uh, which means I can leave the terminal shared, but also have another copy of the HackMD document here. I don't know why I'm addicted to HackMD. I find it absolutely delightful. I really, really, really like it. So I use it quite a lot in my teaching as well. Uh, although today is not how Dave uses HackMD. Today is about Docker. So let's get back to that. If you've got questions though, feel free to paste and I'll notice some activity in the HackMD um, uh, document on my other monitor as well as the first one that I'm using. Let's edit this Docker file back to the, the, the primary goal here. Now I'm going to use the nano editor just because I, well, I'm just going to and it will leave the editor on screen here. You can use whatever editor you want to edit that file uh, and it should be fine. Um, I'm going to just use nano docker file. This will mean that you'll lose the terminal contents temporarily uh, while I'm doing that editing, but I'll talk through the changes. And then when I leave that editor, I'll also do another cat docker file so that you see what the docker file has in it. And then um, we, can, we can work through that content. So running the nano command, this allows me to edit the docker file. What I'll do first of all is uh, remove all of these comments on the right hand side, just so we get uh, clean content ready for me to talk through what we're going to do. So I've now got my cursor at the end of the from line. You can probably have a bit of a guess as to what this all refers to. From in a Docker file indicates which image we're going to be building on top of. And this is one of the first places I need to remember to add in that particular tag number. So in the materials for the workshop, it says Alpine. But of course for us, we have to say Alpine and then a number which I've completely forgotten. So let me see if I can figure out how to scroll my window without quitting here. It's up here somewhere. 3.9, right. 
having short-term memory, I can see how that would be useful, but um, yeah, toddlers fix that. Um, so we've got our point 3.9, that's gonna be what we are creating from. We're building on top of that particular um, container image. That's our starting point. Then what do we do? We wanna run some commands. In this case, we're gonna run two commands when we're building this new image that we can distribute to our collaborators that they can see what we did, you know, that we took this starting point container and then added to it. So the first command that we want to do is that apk command that did the installation of the Python packages. So you could copy and paste it from your own um, terminal window. Uh, I'm just gonna type it so that I'm kind of, I, I, I actually don't know why I'm typing it. I suppose I'm just introducing the chance of errors, which is an odd thing to do. In fact, now when I use computers, I almost always try to force myself to use copy and paste, even if I think there's no way I'm gonna mistype something because I'm usually wrong. There is a way I mistype it. Anyway, you can scream on chat if I've unsuccessfully managed to copy that command that we'd run before. The next command that we ran was we ran this pip command to install the somewhat mysterious, because we didn't use it, uh, Cython um, uh, package in, in Python using pip, which is Python's own package manager, or at least one of them. The last line here is this, um, it's a command which would be what the Docker container is going to do when we create a new one. So if we go Docker run and then our particular container, what's it gonna do? It's gonna run this particular command. And in this case, we'll do something a little bit different uh, from what we're doing interactively. I'm gonna print out the version of Alpine Linux. So that means it will just produce an output. And in addition with this double ampersand, I'm going to print out the version of um, uh, oh, nice, thank you for that. Yeah, there's a couple of typos I noticed, but good to know that the default has a typo. Um, so Python double dash version. So to be honest, actually, this content is content that's um, been a uh, good question. Are the Docker file commands case sensitive? I don't know the answer. So we can try to find out by making form lowercase and see what happens. I mean, you don't need to do this. I'll do this on my one and um, we can see uh, what is going to happen when I try that. I'm now going to write out this file. Well, of course, I'm going to come back and probably need to change it to uppercase soon. It's certainly the, up, the convention is to have uppercase, just like the convention for SQL database queries is to have uppercase. Uh, I presume it probably should work. I'm writing out that Docker file and apologies, I will quit the editor now. Um, and that means it will disappear, but then I will write cat docker file again so you can see it on my terminal. So that's what we have in there. Remember, yours probably should be uppercase for that because we're just seeing whether or not docker complains. I think the reason for having uppercase even you know, normally as a convention is because you do want a differentiation between this and the rest of that line, you know, because this is an instruction to what docker is gonna do when it runs the building steps for your uh, Docker file, whereas this is, is, is actual content of the steps that it's supposed to run. So I think that's why they have that differentiation there. Right, so we're in the position where unless it needs from to be an uppercase, which we'll soon find out, we can run the build instruction. And this is another Docker command, unsurprisingly. We say that we're gonna do a build and we give it a, a tag. In this case, dash T means give it a tag. And here is one of those cases where if you follow along too closely, you'll end up using my username, but you shouldn't do that. You should use your Docker Hub username there. But at the moment, even if you don't have a Docker Hub account, it doesn't actually matter because we're not interacting with the hub yet. This tag is a name that would conform to the conventions used by the Docker Hub, but we're not actually pushing it to the Docker Hub yet. So let's call this um, Alpine Python, Alpine dash Python, because of the fact it's got um, Python installed on top of Alpine. I mean, really, we should possibly even call it Alpine 3.9 Python, given that we're now diverged away from Alpine latest as of yesterday. Um, the other thing we need to do is put a space and a single dot. And what that says is that the Docker file location is the current directory. So you don't always have to use a dot. The point is that that full stop is shorthand for the current directory that we're in, in this terminal window. If you gave it a directory name, then that should work as well. But in this case, we're running the Docker build 
command in the same directory where the Docker file is present. Therefore, dot tells the Docker build command to run using this particular Docker file. So let's see what happens. Okay, well, it seems pretty clear that it doesn't care that from was lowercase. So that answers that question. And it's run through these steps. It's indicated there are four steps and there are indeed four different lines in our Docker file and it's progressing through those. I will cat the uh, Docker file again, just in case you've lost that from before. What you can see here is, um, does Docker file have to be called Docker file? You're so good at asking all these questions, which are very logical, but I've not really even thought about. I suspect it's just a default. I suspect you can tell the Docker build command to use something that isn't called a Docker file. Uh, but the, the, the idea of Docker file is a reference to like make file, make file being the typical name used by the make command to build, you know, to, it doesn't really matter what the make command is for, but for developing software, there's this convention that make reads make files and thus docker build reads docker files. Uh, I've not changed that name. It could, um, yeah, you just need to tell it if, if it's going to be something different from that. Again, like latest, it's just a default. Um, uh, actually, that's interesting, isn't it? So one of the points as well, I didn't give it a tag name to, uh, um, a tag, uh, sorry, a version to use, a tag name within respect to the name of this container. So it's used latest here. That could be a little bit confusing to people. It's true that we have tagged the latest release of DME26 or whatever your username is, slash alpine-python. But of course, the alpine that we've used isn't the latest. So that could be a bit messy. Anyway, we'll leave it for the moment and we'll just refer to it using this part of the name and then I won't feel too worried. Well, except that that's your username rather than mine, hopefully. Okay, so the Docker build actually ran. If you are, yeah, so the question is, if you use DME26 instead of your username, then that will be a problem when you push to the Docker hub because it will then try to push to my part of the Docker hub, then that might be fine. If we're in the same team and you can actually do that, or I can give you permissions to do that, then that would be fine. Um, but by default, I mean, I don't, I don't pay Docker for the Docker Hub account that I have. So, so I, I don't get any special privileges. I'm not even sure that I can actually share that. I don't think I can give out privileges for other users to be able to push to my, uh, my images that are on the Docker Hub. But that's a good question. Uh, it is just a name. And in many cases, these names are just a name to say the local Docker software, but they gain semantics when you're using them on the Docker Hub. So good question about the successfully tagged at the end. The reason it says successfully tagged blah, 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 is because as far as Docker's concerned, it's all well and good that we said that, but it doesn't really care. What it cares about is that it built that. However, that's not a very easy to remember name. So in our build instruction, which is now, I'm just gonna use up arrow to show the build instruction. This part here, we could have actually left out. And if, if we'd done that, we wouldn't have attached a human readable tag to whatever image the system had actually built. It would still be able to be referred to with this unambiguous numerical ID, uh, but it wouldn't be able to be referred to by this human readable tag. But that's why there's two separate lines here. Now, why would you say it like that? You might ask. Part of the reason is that these obscure looking IDs are sometimes actually generated as a digest of the content that went into making that particular step. And what that means is that the ID, just like git commit IDs, represent the content that they're talking about. So they use as an identifier for the content, but it might also indicate that if you ran exactly the same steps, to produce a particular piece of content, the digest that you'd form would give you the same numerical ID. That's useful for caching. For the caching, it means that you can then know that nothing changed and you don't need to rebuild it if, if the, the cache still holds as it was before. And I can show you an example of that. Um, and then you, you'll see a little bit more what I'm talking about. But let's just, uh, I'm gonna remove this line because we built this uh, we built this container, but we haven't actually done anything with it yet. So that's, um, we, we want to probably do a bit more, uh, which is in particular, we want to see whether or not um, we can use it. So can we actually go Docker, 
uh, run interactively our, and you'll have to type in your name here, um, Good, good question as well. That's another good point. Where is it built? We built this thing, but none of the files have changed in the local directory. Oh, well, I'll answer that in one sec. Okay, I'll just first of all check whether or not uh, I've actually we've actually successfully built something that works. If we create one of these instances of uh, whatever your username is slash alpine dash python. It's not a dash; it's a hyphen, but that's fine. We run this one. That was, um, it, okay, so it's actually printed out what we want. And remember, because of the command that we set, it's printed the Python version. So I'm going to take this as being sufficient evidence that we have created an image that contains an installed version of a really old version of end of life Python software that might be crucial for our particular piece of research code where we couldn't convince the postdoc to return from whatever they're doing now to go and update the code or whatever the other uh, story is in terms of how that code got created. Where is it? Let's look in Docker image ls. So here, um, what you'll see is under Docker image ls, we have that top line. It was created five minutes ago, and you'll notice the size uh, indicates how much unique storage this Alpine Python needed above and beyond what it was based on. Now also you'll notice that we have two alpines because as we as i just tripped over this is no longer the version that has the uh, end of life python in it anymore uh, so we've now also got this python from which we as python what i'm talking about this alpine from which we built our um, new container so let's then just see i'm going to go into this docker file and um I might just add one extra piece to this and I'm going to nano the Docker file. You don't need to do this if you don't want to, but I'm just going to also add one um, thing at the end that just says hello. And if I save that file and I exit back to the terminal, and again, this is the Docker file that I ended up with. I just added this echo command at the end, which I hope just prints that to the terminal. What I'll do is I'll go back and we'll see whether or not we can rebuild um, this. I'm going to use up arrow rather than typing it again, if that's okay, uh, to the build command. So I'm now saying build again, um, tag it in the same way, and build using the Docker file in the current directory. Let's see what happens. That's faster. And the point is to do with the caching. And it's told you about that. And that hopefully also helps a little bit with the question about what is this whole tagging thing about. Um, if I scroll up, he up here, if you read that, that number, if you remember that, you're doing better than I am. I'm just going to remember it starts with 7A2. That's about as much as my memory is going to go. If we scroll up to where we first built it, um, then you see up here, we've got that same um, ID that's happened. Likewise, when we got to the point of step three of four, we have a BBF2 that is somewhere down here. If we look down here, BBF2 is again shown at the end of step two. So it's just said that in fact, it doesn't need to re-execute this because the Docker file didn't change. That line didn't change in the Docker file. Therefore, it's going to assume that it can use the cache and that it created this layer in its image structure, which was what was in the files and folders in that particular container just after it had run that command. So that's why it didn't reconsult the APK package repository because it's already got a cached version of what the files and folders are just after it ran that command. Sometimes that's not what you want and there are some things you need to be aware of where sometimes something can end up using the cache when you didn't want it to use the cache and there are ways of fixing that. But we've again now built a different one of these resulting images but we've tagged it with the same tag. So we've now it's a different binary thing um, but we've, we've, we're still developing it. So if we're working on this as a project, then we might want to do um, those, those updates. Uh, so, yes, oh, that's interesting. So Alpine Latest is an old version as opposed to a new version. That's interesting. I mean, that's up to them because again, what's in a name, it's largely this is dictated by convention and defaults. I'm gonna use the up arrow to try to run an instance of this Alpine Python container. And here we do see, um, okay, it failed to resize the TTY using default size. That's a, uh, an interesting technical um, aside. I, I do kind of know what it's talking about, but I 
certainly hadn't realized it was going to print that. It did print this load before it gave us that obscure message. So um, that is then, oh, right, sorry, sorry, I see what, you're, see what the question is saying. The point, quite right, is saying that on my computer, what I have cached on my local system is tagged as Alpine latest, but it's actually 19 months old. And that means that what I have locally on my computer as Alpine latest definitely is not what Alpine latest is on the Docker hub. Alpine latest on the Docker hub is uh, a newer version than this. So if I want to update that, then I can request that Docker update that particular image by using, um, uh, I basically just tell it to pull a new version of that particular image. So if I ask it to pull, um, you don't need to do this on your system because yours will be up to date compared to mine. But if I do this, because I, I know that I don't actually depend on that older version of Alpine, it's going to try to find this newer version of Alpine. And now if I use the up arrow to get back to the list of images I have on my system, image LS, then you'll see now we have um, that the tag latest is attached to uh, an Alpine that was created three months ago which is slightly newer than the 3.9 that was created four months ago. But you notice that helpfully Docker has left behind for us the image ID I had before. This is still the Alpine that was created 19 months ago, uh, but it's just not called, it's not tagged with latest anymore because we pulled this newer version of latest. So the tag latest shifted up here, uh, but it, it, Docker isn't gonna just like remove all of these images that were on my system in case containers dependent on them existing for some, ra some reason. But it would now be on my system safe to remove this particular image uh, because I don't have any containers that depend on it. Or even if I do, technically I don't care about that dependency and I'd be willing to remove the containers as well. Right, so there we are. That's um, a more practical search through some of how you deal with the container management than I've perhaps been expecting. And we've now got to creating um, container images. So what I suggest that we do is have a look at uh, an example of where we can create something that's a little bit more complex in a container. Uh, and then we might, we'll have a break. And then after that, we can collaboratively decide uh, what you want to do in terms of the overall lesson plan. Um, yeah. And so Adrian comments that relying on latest to actually be the latest seems like a potential pitfall. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the semantics of latest. So latest has to be updated by whoever's using the naming of the container, but it, it, it also is that it's latest when you refer to it as the latest. So, but absolutely, if you want to make a reproducible system using a tag that by convention is expected to change which particular image it could refer to, that is not a recipe for reproducibility. That's a recipe for non-reproducibility. So what I typically do is I will create an environment that, that does what I want, probably just using latest at first, I'm probably not actually giving any tags to those versions. And then I will go back and once I've got it working the way that I want, and I wanna kind of fix it as like an artifact, then I'll go through and actually make sure that I can do a version that has locked versions for everything that I can lock down just to maximize the potential for reproducibility. And then I'll destroy my system and then build it again and check that it still builds when I've actually um, moved down to having all of the tagged, um, the locked down versions pinned where I want them to try to avoid dependency hell exploding for me. The other point though should be that if we run, and you can definitely do this if you want, if you run Docker push, and you run the name of your, which is your username slash Alpine Python, I believe this should work to, um, does a bit of setup work, but it should work to actually get your data up onto the Docker Hub. And that means that then if you look at your profile page in the web, you should see that you now have um, this particular container. And like all the demos that I do, uh, that involve this kind of work on Docker and Bitbucket and GitHub and many of these other sites. Um, I run a system where I create a, a Dropbox app, for example. I go through this pattern and it gets created and then it gets deleted again. And it gets created and deleted again um, just because of the fact that I needed to remember to delete it when I'm going to start doing another workshop or exercise. So anyway, that should now have pushed to the Docker Hub uh, that, named, um, that named image. And that means that anybody now can docker pull, you know, docker run, because it will do a pull automatically if you don't have a local uh, version of that image. 
you've got that global sharing of those containers, which is just fantastic. So in terms of distributing content, um, that's probably as far as we really need to go at some level in terms of the motivation for Docker. But there's many more things that we probably want to talk about, about how you can build images that do something useful. Now, one of the things which I'm keen to talk about, and then I think we'll have a break, is looking at cases when you want to pull, and pull, it's a bad word, it's been overloaded by Git and Docker. Um, you want to integrate local files that are near your Docker file as you are building your containers, or possibly that we want to look at cases where you dynamically connect files that are in your host system into places that your containers can access. So that's dynamic sharing of directories. That is useful if you want to have your Docker containers produce results that get written back as output files into the host file system. For example, the 212, um, the, 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 the web paper um, container that I use for teaching that, the files that get shown on the students' web servers are contained in a folder set up on their host computer. So we use this, well, we'll see it later, we use this idea of sharing volumes to take a particular folder on the host computer and make it appear inside the container so the container can actually use that as the thing from which to serve website content. Um, that's an example of, of what we do. Alternatively, you could build a system where, you know, for example, if I made my LaTeX system, I could uh, create something that you share into it, a folder that contains your LaTeX documents, uh, the LaTeX type setting system then runs inside my container and the PDF that's produced at the end gets written back out to that particular directory on your host system. That's a very useful workflow, although of course, again, you do need to trust the container that you're using because it's then reading and writing files from your host file system. So. Um, I'm not sure if I should trust myself, but I'm often running containers I've made myself. So I'm assuming I can at least take responsibility if I destroy my own files using my own containers. Let's look at the first simpler case though. That's not where we set up a dynamic connection between our host files and what's inside our containers, but instead where we just take a file that's sitting in our host file system and integrate it into our image as we build the container. And so in this case, we'll, we'll, we'll keep on the, um, the, oh yeah, true, as another point, yeah, if you're running Docker with sudo, then if you're running it as root as well, so that's another reason that you definitely want to trust the source of your um, containers because, uh, yeah, definitely there can be some security implications there. The security implications are different for the different operating systems because if you're using sudo to run the containers on Linux, it's very likely that your host system with all of your files is running uh, on the same Linux kernel that's running the containers. Whereas using Docker Desktop on Mac OS and Linux, there's an extra layer of indirection because actually Docker Desktop is under the hood running a Linux virtual machine, as I said before. So there, the security would mean that if you've got a security breach in your Docker containers, it's only going to spread within the Docker sort of the Docker virtual machine that's running on Mac OS or Windows. It won't necessarily break out to the host system. And also apologies for talking in those terms. Usually most work, well, many workflows in Docker, you don't have to worry about um, the security implications like that. So I don't want to scare people off, uh, but it is, uh, well, I can't help it because I'm a security researcher as well as being interested in cloud computing. So that's why security keeps popping up as a topic. Anyway, here, let's go and have a look at the other directory that we have in our um, remember where we are, the Docker intro zip. Um, so I'm going to change up a directory and then change into the sum directory and have a look at what files are in there. Now, I think if I fix this, um, oh, that's right. Yeah, okay. So this is exactly the same Docker file we had in our basic um, subdirectory. But this one here, if we have a look inside cat, this is an example taken from the Python um, wiki. Uh, which looks like it should work on Python version two as well as version three, hopefully. Um, so this is um, something that will print out um, some a sum of numbers that are given to this particular program. But the point here is that sum, this Python file is actually contained on our host system and the Docker file. Let's update that Docker file by, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just copy across from the other directory uh, from basic 
I'm going to copy across the Docker file and I'm actually just going to nuke using the current directory this Docker file to be exactly the same as the one we had in basic. So if I cut this now at the sum subdirectory, that's what I have in there. Uh, and if you don't mind, just I'm going to edit that to make the first from uppercase because uh, it's just going to make me feel, I don't know, it's just going to make me feel slightly satisfied in some way. So that's now what we have in our Docker file sitting within the sum folder here that has alongside that Docker file the sum.py. And the goal of this step in terms of what we want to achieve is copying in that sum.py file into the Docker image as we build it. As you would expect, if we try to run the, and you have to use your username, of course, Alpine Python, and we want to try to run Python and run this script that's sitting in our host file system, this is not going to work because Python can't find the file sum.py. It doesn't automatically get access to this directory on our host system. And in this case, we're not even aiming to give it access to this host directory. We're aiming to take this file and copy it into the image, um, the image that the containers will be built from. So we can uh, do some work there. We want to try to fix this. Um, what we want to do is, uh, let's see, there's two ways of looking at this. Um, oh, okay, right, all good. Okay, so we can just jump straight into this one. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna present an example first where we can set up a sharing environment that actually does share this current directory. So apologies, I'll swap the order in which I'm presenting things just because the material's been presented in a different order um, since the last time that I actually ran through this part. I checked that it worked, but I didn't notice that the order had changed. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna try to set up an environment where our container created from this particular image is gonna have access to the um, host file system my Mac OS system, just this particular subdirectory, so that it can actually run that Python script. And it works like follows. So Docker run as we had before, but we'll have a new switch in here. And this switch is the dash, uh, the, the hyphen V switch, which says we're gonna create a volume in Docker terms. That's why it's V, is we're creating a volume. What a volume does is it takes a particular file system location that you give it on the host system, and it, it does what's called, um, well, it mounts that location into a place that you specify in the file system that's inside the running containers. And so in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the um, current working directory and under Windows, you may need to actually type in the current working directory uh, in a different way. So I hope this works for you. It depends slightly on whether you're using command.exe or whether you're using PowerShell. I think PowerShell works a bit more directly. I believe maybe in PowerShell and also in um, Mac OS and Linux, you can run that command to try to expand the current directory there. Uh, I could also just type out the current directory if I use the print working directory um, to, to get the full name. And um, Windows, I believe it doesn't matter if you use forward slashes or backslashes for the way that the Docker commands work, but uh, just let us know if this doesn't work for you. What we're saying though is share this particular place, the current working directory, which is this folder here that I moved into um, sum that just contains the Docker file and the sum Python file. I'm gonna say take that so this, on this side, this is a file system location on the host computer. On the other side of the column, we get a file system location on the guest, which is inside our actual Docker containers. So we'll say here, let's put it in at temp. So slash temp will become a mounted version of the directory from our host operating system. And then we need to say what we're doing it, what image we're using. So it's gonna be this image. Uh, and we wanna say then, what we wanted to do subsequently. And in this case, what we can do is, if we try doing just Python sum.py, that's not gonna work because the directory where the Python program's running in our Alpine container is not necessarily the directory where sum.py is. However, we know that slash temp should become a version of the current working directory. Therefore, we should be able to say slash temp slash sum.py. And that should be referring to this file on our host file system. Uh, if this all works, let's see, I'm gonna test that and find what I've done wrong. For me, it works okay. 
let me know if it doesn't work for you, um, particularly in the chat window, um, because it's probably just that uh, this path needs to be done correctly uh, on Windows to make that work. Um, if this expansion doesn't just work out of the box. But like I said, I'm pretty sure that in PowerShell, this should actually just work because uh, I have tested it on PowerShell, um, but just in the past, I don't have a Windows machine in front of me at the moment. So that worked to do what some um, produced. Now we've already built this image. So we didn't rebuild the image in this case. We just dynamically shared a script. We should probably show, and I'm just gonna modify some .py very slightly, that we did actually use this particular script. One of the things I often try to, um, ah, thank you, okay, good, 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 that's excellent. Yeah, so percent sign cd percent sign, if you're using command.exe under Windows, instead of um, this dollar sign pwd part. So um, thanks, Adrian, that's great. Yeah, I wasn't exactly sure. I, said, I think on PowerShell, what I've got here is okay, but on command.exe, the older terminals under, um, you know, it's more widely available on Windows, uh, you, that doesn't work. And, but percent CD percent will work. So we can just, I'm just gonna edit the Python script just to say, well, we've got this example here. So let's actually say, um, I'm just gonna change, um, I will, put a space after that. That's a very, very minor change, but I'll save that file. And then the hope is that if this is working as expected, we should then see a space appear after that equals sign. But you notice that we didn't rebuild the container. Okay, so this is dynamically sharing content. It's also the case that uh, the container can write content out into this directory as well. And I can if you want, you don't have to follow along if you don't want to, but I can demonstrate this. If I go and run, uh, oh, actually, I, I won't do it in this case because I think that might just, oh, no, I'll give it a go. I'll see if I can fail to get this to work. Let's see if I just run a shell here. So by all means, follow along if you wish, but you don't need to in this case. Okay, that didn't work because I didn't make it interactive. So I need to make it an interactive one. So yeah, you can watch me if you want rather than doing it yourself. But let's say if we ls, temp in our container, we do actually see the files on the host file system. And if we say boo into a file in slash temp, so um, data.txt, don't know why I called it that, but I'll go with that. And then we exit from our container and then we ls, then you'll see that we do have this new file that we created um, that was created from inside our Linux system. So, so this is definitely a useful way of really sharing content. Containers mostly that need to create artifacts are gonna need some way in which they actually deliver what they've produced. And this volume sharing is a powerful way of facilitating that. As I mentioned, we used it in the website example uh, for sharing content uh, where the students have the website files they wanna produce on their host system, whatever that is. Um, and then that gets shared into the particular lamp stack that we use to show the website running. There is um, lots of different ways that you can do this work in terms of getting files into your containers. Because they're running cut down Linux systems, you can also use, uh, if, if you have Git installed within the container itself, there's no reason why it the container can't use git commands to actually pull from repositories that contain useful information. So you know, the, there's no limit to how complicated you can make that depending on how you want that to work. Just thinking about reproducibility is important. If you end up depending on resources, you do need to keep an eye on what those dependencies end up actually becoming um, in terms of all the different parts, the moving parts of your system. So if it's okay, I think it probably is a reasonable place to uh, take a quick break. And, um, and that we will then maybe come back in, we have uh, at least another um, 10 or 15 minutes, um, maybe 15 minutes might be more generous or the 15 minutes that's getting shorter as I keep talking about it rather than doing it. So watching my clock, that means that maybe at 11.40, we can continue uh, and um, just, I will either complete or demonstrate or talk about some of the remaining material that's in the workshop resources uh, so that you can um, see where you can take this next in terms of the training material. And then we'll open up more generally to discuss 
ideas and issues and, and, and further directions where you might want to take these types of technologies and I'd happily, I'd happily do Q&A as well. So see you soon. Let's come back at 11.40 to continue. Right, and we're back virtually, hopefully. I have changed the terminal window slightly just because uh, there was an issue with respect to people's user interfaces getting in the way um, because I was writing right down the bottom of the screen. So we get, here's a question, working on a HackMD page, if you can see that content easily. I don't think we'll need extra lines of terminals. That's all good. There was a discussion about security in chat in the meantime, and I think that's a topic we can talk about at the uh, end when we have worked through a bit more material and then can open up more generally to discuss uh, whatever you want to talk about and where we can go in future. Um, looking at what we have, I mean, time-wise, this is all going very well, and we're due to finish, I think, around 12.30 or so, um, not least so that you've got enough time to get uh, lunch before staying on for looking at the HPC context of using Singularity for managing your containers instead of Docker in the afternoon, which starts at 1.30, the other workshop that's hosted as part of the conference. But what I'd like to cover, I think, uh, assuming that nothing explodes or that other people don't say that you want to cover something else instead, is another mechanism of integrating content into containers where you get the equivalent of that sum.py, but you build it into your container as you're building the containers. And then have a look at two other areas. One is um, looking at an example of using containers that pertains to this workshop. That's sort of the last part of the uh, exercises. And the other is to look at where you can apply containers in the context of continuous integration. So that leads out into overlaps a little bit with security topics, but it's certainly one of the areas that I find containers to be very useful. It's only one of a type of use case you might have for it though. So let's have a look at this example now. What we'd like to do is form a version of the Alpine container that is instead of being Alpine Python, Alpine hyphen Python, it's Alpine, Alpine hyphen sum, because we copy in sum.py into the container itself. So we will be building a different container image and it will integrate the script that we have in the current directory, this uh, current directory here in my terminal window where we're sitting um, in terms of the exercise files. So the way that you do that is you make a modification to the docker file. So I'll open up the nano editor here and look inside the docker file. What we can do here is, um, and again this is covered in the resources for this workshop, we can open up a new line here that will, oh, whoops, I forgot to start my video. Sorry, my hand waving is present again. I can wave hands. Um, I don't know if that helps. You can also just remove the window entirely and then you don't have to watch me waving my hands. Uh, so in this Docker file, we can add a new line and there's a new type of command that we can add, which is called copy. And copy, I guess it doesn't care about white space either. So if you like lighting up things, and fixed with fonts, then that's just made our file a little bit cleaner. I don't think it should have changed the caching, but we will find out whether it does. That's just a thought that just occurred to me. So in this case, what we want to do is have um, this copy instruction. The sum.py is available in the same directory as the Docker file. So this should, you know, this is probably not totally robust to all ways of building Docker containers, but it'll be good enough for us now. And we want to say, where do we want to copy this to? Uh, we want to say um, that we, oh, okay, sorry, beg your pardon, the copy, the contents of the sum.py in the tutorial page. Absolutely, let me just grab that. Um, I will just finish writing this one and then I'll put that, actually, no, that doesn't make sense. I'll do that more quickly. Uh, let me get the right window. Sum.py. Uh, let me get some.py. I'm just going to quit this and not save changes. I know I will save changes, but we'll come back to this in a second. I'm just going to copy this across so people can get some.py if you don't happen to have the this easily available through the zip file. So now in the HackMD document, you have a version of that pasted. Um, if you want to copy and paste that 
from the HackMD document across into your uh, file system here. But it's important that sum.py is sitting in the same directory as the Docker file. I might remove this data.txt file that we just used as a demonstration to create files from inside the container through volume mounting, because we don't really need that. It's just going to kind of get in the way. Well, it doesn't get very much in the way, it gets slightly in the way. So let's say then we've got, uh, go back to my Docker file, which I was editing, if I can get to the correct window. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo, where are my Docker file? Now, that's not quite what we wanted, but it was along the lines of what we might want. Um, what I'm going to do is say that we are going to copy this into, say, slash home, okay, the home directory. Uh, and I might also just remove the echo hello because that isn't particularly important either. So I will save this file and I'll also print it out on the terminal so you can check that your file version is consistent with mine. So that's the Docker file there. Uh, so the one thing that we've added is this copy instruction, which says copy the sum file that's sitting next to the Docker file and put it into this location. And this is a location that's inside the Docker container. So hopefully then we can then run a Docker build instruction and we will tag this as DME 26 Alpine sum. So we're sort of including the fact that Python's already in there and with a space and a dot to tell us that to tell um, Docker that the Docker file we want to work with is the one that's sitting in the current directory. Okay, so if we do that, then um, we can press return here and hopefully that will work. So you see it runs through all the commands again. You've got the cache being used for the first two commands because the Docker file is similar to a sequence that it's already recorded somewhere else. So it figures it doesn't need to re-execute those uh, instructions, but this one is new. And now also it means that because this has changed the sequence of uh, layers, then also it's going to have created a new layer here. Um, it tells you some information about other things that the build is doing in the meantime, but then it builds that as the final, um, the final kind of image that we're working with. That's the image and then it gets tagged in this way. So that hopefully should then mean that uh, we have in this Alpine sum, if we were to go docker run uh, interactive DME26 or your version of the same type of idea, sum, and then run a shell inside this, then if we type ls slash home, then we do in fact see the sum Python, uh, the sum, uh, Python file there. So if we run Python in our container, then we should hopefully be able to uh, run this program. And indeed that then does run um, from inside our container. We can also then modify this command in the Docker file to do something more logical, given that now we've built a, an image that's copied in that sum.py, you know, it's quite likely that that might be the only thing we actually want this particular image to do. So we can change the highlighted line that I've shown here to change the way in which uh, the Docker file actually runs this program uh, so that um, you can end up with a container where um, you don't need to kind of be explicit about the Python instruction to run at the end of this Docker run line. And then in fact, by default, if you just did the first part of the line, then it would actually run that particular Python script. So I'm going to exit from here. It just demonstrates another way that we could build um, a, an image that copies files in to that image as it's building it. So if we change sum.python sum.py in the current directory now, a modification to this file, uh, it will not be reflected in what's running inside our container, okay? Because our container image now has integrated when it ran the build instruction, it copied in the sum.py. So what do you want to do? Do you want to copy in those types of files as you're running the Docker build? Or do you want to have a system where you build a Docker environment and then you require the user to use the dash V option to mount uh, resources that the container can see. There's no right answer. It depends on the context of what you're trying to do. There's a number of considerations in terms of how you structure uh, the building process. And there's uh, a lot of documentation that is on the Docker uh, website about best practices for building Docker files. Now, I mean, at first, 
you want to just get Docker to do something useful for you. And if it can help you sharing code or using other people's code, uh, particularly working in collaborative projects, that's great. You don't need to get worried by the best practice aspects. But there are some examples where tweaks to the way that you use, you know, the way that you run your Docker file may have an impact on, for example, the size of the images that you produce. And so there are ways that you can minimize the image size. Now, if you're working with you know, an internet rich, uh, in an internet rich context in the organization or whatever, that's not really a concern. You don't have to worry about like, you know, whether or not you end up producing a container that's a gigabyte in size versus 600 megabytes. Maybe that makes no difference at all to anyone. But as you saw with something like Docker's own Hello World, uh, image, they definitely try to minimize that as much as possible. And they actually use Hello World as an example, as they say on the hub page, of how to minimize um, that content. One of the things that's very common as a workflow is that you have a basic, um, probably often a cut down Linux distribution. That's your from, the image that you're building from in terms of your Docker file. And then often you'll want to install some more software. How you do that depends on your distribution. So I often use Debian or Ubuntu, which means you use the apt and apt get sequence of commands. They're the ones where you install new software. We saw APK was the package management command that you use under Alpine Linux. You have, um, uh, you have yum under say CentOS, and there's other examples of different package managers for different Linux variants. So you can use whatever you're comfortable with, uh, but there will be differences between those different uh, package management systems when you're installing packages. Another thing which is useful is when you're trying to build a container, it's good to start with the most managed pre-existing container that you can find. So we've looked at taking Alpine Linux and installing Python into it. Well, it might not surprise you that there's probably already a container managed by probably the Python team that has Python installed over Alpine or something like that. You can look on the Docker hub for pre-existing containers that have already done the work that you want to do. Uh, I usually would just do a Google search rather than necessarily worrying about exactly where to find it in the Docker hub because you might, the naming might not be completely clear what you're looking for. Um, so yes, um, right. Um, Moving sum.py, you mean the copying instruction? Is that what you mean, Roy? Just asking about your question there about the directories? Yeah, okay, so in that case, that's right. The copy here is, um, it's a copy instruction. This is a, lo a, um, a location on your host system. So in this case, this works without any extra path name because sum.py is in the same directory as the Docker file. So when we run the Docker build instruction, then we're referring to a Docker file and this is the Docker file. And that means that what's then inside the Docker file as a file name ends up being able to be found because it's in the same directory as the Docker file. I've not experimented with what happens when you try to use a build instruction that refers to a Docker file, it's in a different directory, whether or not you'd need to then also give a full path name for sum.py. But in this case, the copy command, when it's trying to run the build, will give you some error message. It will just say, can't find the file. So that will give you some feedback as to what's actually gone wrong there. But the important point is that this is a concept of files on your host, and this is a concept of files within your container, because this is when it's actually making the image, the files and folders that end up in the lightweight virtual machine. So we've put it into the home directory there. Uh, so that's um, the other point, yeah, the point that I made about you want to start with um, the most managed container, because again, as I've already shown with say dependency on latest, no worries, the dependency on latest, uh, you want to keep that up to date. If you're dealing with containers that have a network presence, like they run a web server, then you do need to consider about security updates if, if you know, they're gonna be internet facing in some regard, and then you need some consistent way of actually managing those containers. It's good to minimize the work that you need to do. So you shouldn't need to rebuild your container when people release a new version of Python and or Alpine if there's already a group of people who are going to release a new version of those containers because they're already in the Python and or the Alpine team. You, know, you can just leave them do the work and, and take advantage of the way that they're containerizing their results. That also connects to different use cases for containers. In many cases, 
we've looked here at where you might consider containers for reproducible research, which means you might run them on your own computer to do some useful data processing task. Admittedly, we haven't done very useful data processing tasks, but the hope is you can see how you could now, for example, grab R or whatever your you know, favorite package system is, Python, uh, and you can experiment with the idea of creating these, these units, the Docker images that you can share through the Docker hub that you can then have other people reproducibly produce results with. Uh, and there are some more complex examples in the lesson materials as well that you can look at. Um, so I give some examples of like using Python scripts with graphing libraries to produce a graph from a sort of CSV file, things like that. You can end up with a process that's reproducible in terms of how you create those, those results. Um, it's also very, very useful to not do what I do necessarily on my Docker Hub, uh, but if you can, it's very, very useful to create readmes and documentation that indicates how people should use your container. Particularly when these resources are public, you can usually tell pretty quickly whether they're going to be widely supported or not. The widely supported ones have really good documentation. They have good readme files. It's clear how you're supposed to start actually using um, the work that has been shared into the Docker Hub there. So what I am now going to talk about just really briefly, uh, feel free to follow along if you wish to do so. Um, but this, there's two other parts to what I can talk about in terms of the lesson material that's been shared into this chunk, which will fit in the time available, I believe. And um, then we can talk, open up more broadly for discussion. And as I, as I mentioned before, we had the first break. So the first example that I'm going to use is slightly obscure. This is not the way that you'd normally do it, but I'm just doing it this way because it's a kind of quick experiment um, to show functionality of a cloud service that uh, is running containers that um, are under your control in a particular context. So in this case, I'm just going to sort out um, things, something on another window here. What I suggested, and I said, if you've created a Bitbucket account and you want to follow along and test this out, by all means do so, but this is a slightly odd use case. I mean, this is not the way that you'd normally use continuous integration. The takeaway point here is not the specifics of what I've done, but the general idea that once you've created something that's been pushed to the Docker Hub, you can use it in other cloud infrastructure. And that's a use case where the container that you're dealing with is being run on someone else's computer rather than a workflow where you're running the container on your own computer or on your collaborator's computer. So I can step through this example to show it running uh, and then we will return to another example that's a bit more local that you can also test out and then we can as it workshop whether or not these examples have worked for you um, smoothly or not. So what I'm gonna do here is, is use a particular um, container uh, that I've created before. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna have a quick look at, uh, in this case, I've created a container that I've, um, let's see, maybe, hmm, I'm just thinking what the easiest thing to do is. Yeah, okay, so we have pushed to the Docker Hub. Let's look at my Docker Hub page. I'll go to the web over here. Uh, and if we look at my profile, we should see that GME26 Alpine Python was pushed. Okay, so this is the one that we tested before that I believe if we look inside this on the hub, we can look through the web interface from Docker's hub to see, okay, there's no overview available. Um, okay, so in this case, yeah, no, that's fine. In this case, that's we're not going to see all the details that I don't otherwise want to see. But we do have this, this container that's ready to run. Um, it's not particularly large, so I think the tags will show us that. Uh, 24 megabytes, that shouldn't, that shouldn't be a problem for anyone. So you've also pushed, uh, if you've also pushed your Alpine Python containers onto um, the Docker Hub, then you'll be able to follow along directly here. I'm just trying to remind myself if I search back through my history, what does the Alpine Python, um, I'm just going to search backwards by pressing Control R and typing Alpine dash Python. I'm just going to try to remind myself by grabbing this command here, what this does if you just run it straight off. 
uh, because I'm deviating slightly from the instructions which I'd used before. Okay, fine. So, uh, yes, okay. Good. So this is I said, a slightly unusual example, but I'm just demonstrating that you can have your resources used on other cloud providers. Let's jump over. If you want, you can just watch me do it or you can follow along to Bitbucket. And Bitbucket is an Atlassian service that is effectively a competitor to GitHub, except it's not really a direct competitor to GitHub uh, because they sell other things into organizations, Atlassian are more likely to want to have private organizational support rather than GitHub, which is, um, you know, they overlap, but they're, they're slightly different points. Bitbucket does have a mechanism for managing code repositories, and they have one of the systems for continuous integration that has been around for quite a long time. GitHub has subsequently added its own method for continuous integration. Uh, so this example, I probably will end up changing to actually using GitHub rather than using Bitbucket in future, just because more people will spend more time on Bitbucket. What's continuous integration? The idea of continuous integration is that if you have resources, like you have a Git repository that contains data, the idea of continuous integration, particularly in a Git context, is that when you push content into your Git repository, it triggers some kind of computational task that does something useful. So in the case that I mentioned, if I had a kind of LaTeX uh, scientific document and I push content that updates um, the source code of that document that specifies what should be typeset, I can have continuous integration run the LaTeX typesetting system to produce the PDF that comes out the other end, typesetting the material that's in the LaTeX input. And certainly you know, that's how I do all my research paper writing. Uh, if I can avoid it, I try to never touch Microsoft Word because uh, it has a tendency to bite my fingers. Whereas LaTeX uh, I've used for a long time and I've already survived the vertical learning curve of using that particular technology. Plus LaTeX does much nicer typesetting than Word, but that's a whole different discussion to have. So in general, that's an example of continuous integration. You push content to a repository, and some kind of code can react. Now, when you're trying to get code to react, what's a logical way to package up the thing which can react to the Git push? Well, containers are a great example. And so that's, we're not gonna show all the details of that, but we're gonna see an example of Bitbucket running a slightly mangled version of one of our containers in the context of um, their cloud service. And the main thing which is important is that it's gonna be running on their service, their servers, rather than ours. So let's log in here to Bitbucket and you'll have to use your own account um, because uh, unless I do something terribly wrong, I'm not gonna be putting my own password on screen. Uh, and I don't even need to use that one. I don't think I do have a password manager. So that means I've already unlocked the right bits. I'm logging into Bitbucket. Like I said, you, don't, you can follow along if you wish to uh, or the recording, or you can just watch me do it as well if you want, because we're not gonna spend very long in this particular example. So I'm gonna log in. Like many of these teaching examples, I'm probably gonna to have to delete the thing that I'm gonna show that I'm creating because I probably created it to test that it worked and thus it's probably still sitting in my Bitbucket account. So let's have a look at the repositories that I have in my account. Um, so this one is the one that I mentioned uh, is going to be the one that I want to delete so I can create it again and show you. So I apologies for not having deleted this already. I'm gonna delete this container and then recreate it. You don't have to follow along uh, with this example at the moment because uh, you don't need to delete a repository that you haven't created yet. It's hidden away here, delete repository. Yes, delete it, okay. So apologies, you shouldn't have needed to see any of that. Now let's create a repository. The instructions and the resources you know, indicate that you can use the create button um, to create a repository. So if we click create here, and click repository. I could have also clicked the button that was shown on the main page as well. We are asked to select a workspace and you'll get a, I've got a couple that I've used in different contexts, but here I'm just gonna use my own personal workspace and a project, I'll just leave it untitled or create a new project. I don't really care about the project because this is only gonna exist very transiently before we end up, I end up throwing it away again. So I don't really particularly care. Uh, let's say I'm gonna give it a different name. And that also means I'm going slightly off piste from the instructions, which probably means I'm gonna trip myself up and get it wrong. Uh, but hopefully I can rely on all of us to help me fix it. 
we've got to give the repository a name. Let's just say use Alpine Python. Again, the name doesn't really matter, but I'm just trying to make a note to myself. Of course, that means I didn't need to delete the other one because I've just given it a different name. Anyway, that's never mind. This is all good. We're going to create a new repository. This is like creating a GitHub repository, but we're creating it on Bitbucket. We'll create that repository. Uh, we didn't need to change any of the other default settings, and that should be fine. So it's created a repository for us called Use Alpine Python. And as that suggests, I'm aiming to use Alpine Python within the context of this repository. I'm not really going to care about any of the files and folders in this repository because I'm, as I said, this is a slightly unusual way of working. What I care about is pipelines because in Bitbucket, pipelines uh, is the system which allows you to run Docker containers in response to events that happen on Git repositories contained on Bitbucket. All of the other major web-based Git repository systems, GitHub, GitLab, well, that's all the ones I can think of, those ones also have an equivalent functionality now, or multiple equivalent functionalities, but um, Bitbucket has been around for a long time. I'm going to click on pipelines here for our use Alpine Python example. And then I'm going to do, this is where it will get slightly unusual. Here we have um, a splash page that is advocating for continuous integration in the cloud. And again, this is the takeaway point. We're going to be running our container on someone else's servers for free, as it happens, in the cloud. We're going to start using pipelines. We can click on that link, uh, and it's going to allow us to choose one of these language templates. Um, just to be clear the docker template here is not about necessarily running your docker containers that's a template for building docker containers so it makes sense that you might put the materials that we've discussed for building you know alpine dash or alpine hyphen python or alpine hyphen sum we might well put that into a git repository and that's where then the docker build instruction would be the thing that continuous integration could do for us so we would actually create the container image every time we change the docker file that would be a useful thing to do it's that's actually something that docker hub can already do for you uh, but i can talk about that at the end in this case i'm going to say more and other and more and other is just going to mean we're not using a, sp a specified template it's going to open up for us um, this example yaml file which is the specification about how the pipeline will run when pushes are made to this particular git repository and as i said i'm only just using this as a mechanism to kick off running one of our containers or in this case it's one of my containers shared with the uh, docker hub and so here what i can do is i can change this image to be the container that i want it to be so we can say dme26 slash and in this case it was alpine python so what we're saying is that the image that we want the Bitbucket cloud to use to help us with this continuous integration is running Alpine Python. Now, the slightly unusual thing is that whereas we ran Docker ran, sorry, Docker run and then the name and then we can tell it a command to run, here we're actually essentially opening up that image. I mean, that is again what I suppose image means, so that makes some sense that we're going to load that image, which means we'll get that from the Docker Hub. Uh, but the commands that we run in the script section are going to be commands that would make sense to run inside that uh, particular image, DME26 Alpine Python in, in this given case. So here we might want to copy across one of the commands that we ran elsewhere. So if I just, um, if I just switch over to the terminal window so I can remind myself what those are, if I have a look inside the Docker file here, then this is the type of command that we might want to run. So if we do that, I'm going to copy that command and I'm going to change back to my other window and I'm going to paste it over the echo, everything is awesome. Not because I don't agree that everything's awesome, although 2020 is a very particular version, which many things are not awesome, um, but that's all fine. Uh, let's see. So the um, that's now okay. The configuration looks good and we can commit this file. Now, the slightly tricky thing here is that this is a file that goes into our repository and it's called bitbucket dash uh, bitbucket hyphen pipeline pipelines dot yml when we commit the specification for the continuous integration 
that will count as committing to the repository and will actually also kick off the continuous integration. So that's why, I mean, this is a fairly unusual way of demonstrating the point I'm trying to make. But when we commit this file, it will end up actually trying to deploy using this continuous integration because the committing of this is actually a commit to the repository. Let's commit the file and see what happens. So we commit that file and that should trigger a pipeline that will then build up um, the pipeline. So it's opened this automatically. I didn't do anything there. It's showing us that this is all coming through the web. Not my computer is not involved in this whatsoever. Uh, no worries, if you've got to go, that's completely fine. Uh, we get some information about what's happening and then it says it's green, tick. Now, what does that mean? Well, you see on the right hand side, build setup, build teardown, and this command, that was the command at the end of our system. If we look there, then uh, the Linux version is slightly different because here we're actually using the one that they offered us up in this Bitbucket environment. But the Python version is the out of date one um, that if I alt tab my way back to um, uh, here, we have Python 2.7.18, switching back to the web browser, that's what we've loaded here. So this does demonstrate that we have got the uh, container that we built being pulled across by Bitbucket on their cloud servers from the Docker Hub, code that we push to the Docker Hub that's then running on their servers and doing something. So I find it really interesting that this is possible and the generous generosity here of the online cloud providers, that took seven seconds to run and that included getting the container from the Docker Hub and running it you get 500 free minutes a month or something completely insane on um, the Bitbucket site. So there's actually a lot that you can do. I've ended up running whole conference websites where the multi-organizational editing of the content management has been done and the whole system has pushed it through to a live web server entirely on the basis of continuous integration that has never ended up actually costing anything because from the perspectives of Bitbucket or GitHub or GitLab, what I'm doing here is rounding error compared to what's happening in terms of the big use by large scale commercial uh, players. So they're happy that I'm happy. Of course, that makes me happy as well. Everyone's happy that we, you end up in this situation where there's a lot that you can now do and automate for high convenience through continuous integration without even needing to pay for it uh, because the free tiers are, are really quite generous for many small scale tasks in these, in these types of contexts. Okay, so I'm going to swap back to the last aspect of what we'll try to look at today, which is uh, looking at an example of a uh, container that also opens up network resources. So hopefully it works um, both for me and for you. And then after that, we'll open up for more general discussion. So this is discussing how containers can be used to actually generate the website of the lesson materials that we've been stepping through and that you were sent the URL for before. In a way, it's a version of what GitHub is doing in its continuous integration when we actually edit the lesson specification that produces the web pages for the lesson. Now, what I'm going to do here is uh, actually follow what it says on this window. I'm going to go to the lesson um, and open up a new, let's see, what have we got open here? Um, okay, this is the lesson plan that I've been working through. The last episode that we can look at is using the containers used in generating this actual lesson. So what I've suggested can happen is that if you open up the GitHub repository that generates this, these lesson files, you can download a zip that contains all of the source code of these actual lesson specification pages. Because I mean, you don't have to keep this. I mean, I'm, I'm not requesting that you keep it as a memento of today because I'm gonna let GitHub keep this content online for you to be able to access in future anyway. But what you can do is you can get a copy of the actual pages that go to generate this very website and we'll see whether or not we can make that build locally using container technology. So again, feel free to step through this if, uh, but I may also move at a reasonable pace where watching, watching me may hopefully be okay um, just because of the fact that uh, I want to make sure we've got some time for questions and answers afterwards. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the main uh, Docker page, oops, the Docker, the, the GitHub web page for this site. And there you'll find that you can, this is, this is seeing the back end, this is seeing all the files that actually go into creating the lesson. We can download the code 
and I'm going to just download it as a zip file. You can get it as a Git repository, but I'm not going to do that in this case. That plops into my downloads folder. So what I'm going to do is go back to my terminal window. Uh, I'm going to use the, un well, I will basically, uh, let's see, uh, I will unzip the file just using my normal file manager, except it's buried behind a Zoom window. Let me try to fix that again. Uh, I've got that here. I've unzipped in my downloads then uh, the content of this lesson. What I'll do is I'll change up a directory. So I'm sitting here in the Docker intro and I'm going to move all of the content from that I just unzipped from uh, my downloads folder here. It's a fairly long file name. So I'll use pad completion to copy that folder here. So I'm going to say use the current directory. Now what I've done is I've grabbed then, if we change into this directory, you will see if I ls, that's the same set of files that we were seeing in the GitHub web page showing us the source code for this lesson. And it's got structure that shows where the episodes go. And you know, this is basically the way that the Carpentries lessons are constructed. Uh, and in many cases, they use uh, continuous integration to do so on, on GitHub in particular. That's how the web pages got created. So we're now sitting in that copy of um, the, you know, you've got all the different episodes and lesson content here. Let's see whether or not we can get this to work. I'm going to type a slightly longer command, but I'll type it out so I can talk through what I'm doing and make mistakes. I'll say docker run. Okay, that's fine. I will use a new double dash command, rm. There's a different, probably single dash version of the same um, switch here, but this says that I want the container to be automatically removed after I finished using it. So it does that cleanup activity that we didn't see happen with our use of the hello world container when we first used it. I'm going to create a volume. I'm going to say share all of the current working directory. And again, if you're using Windows, you'll need to use the appropriate uh, percent command percent of uh, sorry, percent PWD percent or the current working directory. So it's in the chat window anyway, and my short-term memory is demonstrated to be shot. That's the current working directory on my Mac OS machine, our host computer. There's a specific place we want that to go, which in this case is part of the, um, the particular container that we'll use to serve up the content. This is saying, take all of the files that are in our particular uh, copy, no, don't do that, in our particular copy of the, um, uh, the files we downloaded from GitHub and share that through on the inside of our lightweight virtual machine, our container. We're also going to open up a network port. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, open this network port. I will paste this into, well, it's in the lesson material. So you can kind of look from there to find the exact command. I'm going to tell it to open up on port 4000 on my local machine, so on my actual Mac OS computer, port 4000 from inside the container. So I'm mapping a network port between my host computer and the lightweight virtual machine. And then we'll say we'll use the Jekyll uh, package. Jekyll is a system for building, uh, it takes markdown content and it builds websites out of that markdown content. And we can ask it to do Jekyll serve. Now this is a very, very, very long command. I realize that's probably a reason to copy and paste it from the instructions rather than typing it out like that. If this works, then indeed I haven't loaded Jekyll that particular, um, I don't have a local cache copy of that because I tested it on my laptop rather than my desktop that I'm using at the moment. So it extracts all those different layers of the image and when the layers have all been extracted, it can combine them together, which is what it's doing now. And after it's done that, it should kick off actually running the Jekyll serve command that's right at the end of our rather long Docker command. So it's going to think about it for a while and try to do some stuff with Ruby because it's written in the Ruby programming language. But again, Docker means we don't have to care because it's all part of the container. Uh, so hoping that that all works, we'll see whether it does. It hasn't done what I would hope yet, but I am assuming that it's busy doing something. And if this does work, then I can show you what appears on, okay, it's doing something still. Running, running, running. Ruby configuration file, blah, generating. It's now building the pages. And when this is done, it should serve up that particular server address. Now, what this means is if we go over to my computer here and I open up a new Safari window on localhost, oops, localhost on my computer, I can open up localhost port 4000. 
or I could actually type exactly what I typed into the Docker command because 127001 is the same thing. So maybe I should type that HTTP, uh, typing in that address. And now we have this particular page shown. Like, oh, I've seen that page before. Well, you're right. But the difference is that now we are seeing a Docker container create the website for us. And that means that if I want to, someone pointed out there was a, an error on, there's a couple of errors on this page that need fixing. If I change over to our local copy of, um, I'm going to actually create a new terminal window, sorry, create a new terminal window in the same directory, we could have a look at nano index dot markdown. This shows you part of the source code that builds up um, this page. If all is good, then if I can say prerequisites with an exclamation mark, then if I save this file and I quit that editor and we look back on this other page, then uh, it should have noticed, if we're lucky, regenerating. One file changed. So it noticed that a file had changed. Um, and then, uh, yeah, interesting point. Okay, so, so someone's got permissions problems, which is that it needs to be able to read and write, because it's true that in this case, this current directory needs to be able to be written to by the container, because when it's generating that website, it's actually storing the files inside the directories on our host computer. So that's why it needs write access. I hadn't thought about that, or at least under Mac OS, that just happened to work. Um, so that's why in this case, it was, it was fine for me. But if I now go back to this page, the one that's accessing it through um, port 4000, uh, and we reload that, then indeed you see we've now got that updated content. So we have prerequisites with an exclamation mark. So this is demonstrating that I just changed that file I had a Docker container that was watching all of the files in that directory. It saw when I changed that markdown file, automatically rebuilt the website and shared it again through the same address. So this is the way I actually worked when I was writing the lesson in the first time, I was running a Docker container that was actually producing the output of the website. But that's enough recursion in terms of describing how that all works, uh, I think for now. And I think that really that probably covers what I'd like to cover um, so far, I'm very keen that you can move forwards in terms of other things you want to do with Docker. And I'm very happy to continue discussion through the HackMD page, which we'll share. Uh, and also now, if anyone has any particular questions, one of the things which I was going to mention was a bit about security. In many contexts that I use, I'm either running my own containers on my own computers or I'm often now using containers in a continuous integration context. And that means that I define the containers, or maybe I use other people's containers, but often I'm actually getting them to run on someone else's computer. Now, not that I'm trying to be explicitly laissez-faire about using their computer and causing them security headaches. That's not what I'm trying to do. But it does mean that I'm not worried about losing my own files when I'm in one of those workflows where I'm using like Jekyll, a system for building a website, running on you know, GitHub servers or something like that. And the Docker infrastructure, the Docker ecosystem, particularly with a continuous integration process, makes it quite common that you can end up having containers that you define functionality for being run on these other cloud systems. And those cloud servers will be hardened against security problems. So they're expecting that there are some risks from running those containers and they will do the best job they can to make sure that the containers run in a secure way. Does anyone have any particular questions or aspects that you'd like to discuss? Like I said, I'll keep an eye on the HackMD uh, page throughout the rest of the day. And I'm also staying around for um, at least the first good couple of hours of the Singularity workshop. Um, so I'll be online. Uh, I'm not gonna be trying to distract from the Singularity workshop, but I'm, I'm, I'm online in the sense that I can carry out some dialogue in the HackMD document if you're still asking questions there as well. Uh, so other than that, then yeah, I shall stay online. Feel free to discuss or ask questions. Um, we can open up audio that way. Otherwise, I hope that uh, some of what we've covered has been useful. Right, so there was one question. Thank you, Jade, you reminded me. I knew there was another question lurking there that my brain had forgotten. Windows. So Docker, because of the fact that Docker itself is a technology that builds containers over the Linux kernel, first and foremost, that's how it started, Typically, you'll end up with a case where almost all of the containers images that you'll run will be Linux systems, Linux software. So you can run that 
on Linux or on Mac OS or on Solaris or on uh, Windows or whatever operating systems I've forgotten to mention, you can run it on those systems, but usually the actual containers themselves will typically be Linux systems. There is a method of running Windows containers, but it's not going to easily allow you to do something like run Windows XP. And the reason for that is that Windows XP is an older system that you're going to have to run as a complete environment. It wasn't Windows XP wasn't built at a time when this type of virtualization technology, the lightweight virtualization, was explored in the Windows space. So there, you can run a um, you can run the complete Windows XP virtual machine using software like VirtualBox. But the aim there is that the Windows XP that you're running actually believes it's running on a full computer because it doesn't really know about virtualization because virtualization in the Intel sense wasn't actually invented yet. So Intel CPUs didn't support virtualization at the time of early versions of Windows XP. In my case, I actually still have a Windows 2000 system that I run um, that I, I can still do some very old Windows stuff on. And so I keep that around, but I can't do that in a Docker context. I just have to use a full VirtualBox. In my case, I use VirtualBox as the virtual machine manager. I use VirtualBox to run that very old system. So really, really old systems, then you'll often end up doing something where you're running a complete virtual machine. So something like VirtualBox, which will allow you to pretend to be a computer, you know, with a hard disk and a floppy drive. And, you know, it's not a real floppy drive. You can just sort of put in sort of binary files that pretend to be floppy disks into the pretend floppy drive. But from the perspective of the software you're running, it allows you to run that kind of, um, that kind of system. There's a little bit more discussed about that yeah, as well also. So thanks Blair for saying that, that you've got material on that. There's a bit more discussed as well in the, the, the lesson materials that I skipped over when we were working through the material today that discusses virtualization. But in general, anything that is sort of post the invention of Docker, you can now run the Linux versions of those things as lightweight virtual machines, sharing the same Linux kernel. Um, but if you're looking at doing sort of uh, preservation, more digital preservation than just reproduction uh, of, of results, then that's usually likely to involve running in a complete virtual machine. That's definitely an area of interest for me. Uh, for the reasons I alluded to before, I find it really distressing when perfectly functional systems have to be kind of destroyed or replaced at high cost just because of the fact that you know Microsoft doesn't want to maintain Windows XP anymore. I see from Microsoft's side it's expensive to have to maintain old software and they don't want it to run on new systems anyway but it does seem that things are a little bit broken in terms of um, the resource expense when it comes to that. But yeah, so very old laptops for running systems what often will happen is that you'll get uh, you can try to virtualize that whole computer, but that's where you're virtualizing the whole computer, almost including its hardware, rather than trying to just virtualize the software. Virtualizing just the software, that's very much a container type of thing, like Docker or Singularity. Virtualizing the whole computer, that's much more of a sort of virtual box type system. And again, it depends, is the good question that Adrian was asking. Those full virtualization systems will give you a kind of monitor for your virtual computer as well, whereas something like Docker typically doesn't look at cases that supports running a graphical user interface. That's not really its target domain. That's not to say it can't, because it can, but it's not what it's normally used for. Normally, if you want to have a thing that is virtualized and you want it to have a graphical user interface beyond a web sort of page display, you'll often be heading for full virtualization. Yep, all good. There's a lot of very valuable things that can be usefully preserved. But yes, yeah, so in this case, the reproducibility that we're looking at here is of the software systems. And in some cases, you get problems with the older equipment in terms of also having a hardware dependency. And you need to capture all of that in terms of the virtualization. I'll come back and say a little bit more about that. But are there any other questions that people have? Yeah, no worries. My pleasure. Old Fortran is a piece of paint. Yes, well, one of the things that's interesting is uh, it's, it's, I wouldn't say that, I mean, even talking about today's work, I wouldn't say that Docker solves the problem of reproducibility. That's for sure. 
it still takes quite a lot of effort to make reproducible software work in practice for long periods of time. And you know, the longer delay you're talking about, the less likely it is easy to make work. Um, that's, it, it is quite tough. And I mean, I've been interested even running these reproducibility lessons. I've run into non-reproducible things multiple times, but through using Docker, it was at least a lot easier for me to fix. So that's not totally solving the problem of reproducibility, but at least it is minimizing the difficulties. And in some cases, they were problems where I hadn't gone as far as I ideally should, as, as with this example with Python and the Alpine environment, I shouldn't have been relying on the latest tag still supporting these exercises. In fact, we should have locked it to the old version. And in fact, we will. We'll change the Carpentries version of this website to lock to the older version. But I will keep a snapshot of the URL that you have here uh, with the content we use today, just to make sure it doesn't fall terribly out of sync with what we actually worked through in terms of today's video content. Repeating the pipeline example. I hope I can repeat the pipeline example. Yeah, the, um, it, the pipeline example is odd. I mean, I don't think you would ever do what I did. It's covered in the example on the notes here for creating containers in the cloud. Um, so that hopefully can give you the ability to reproduce quite a lot that's here, except that I need to tweak this to match exactly what I used. So I will, um, the pipeline page didn't come up yet. I think I was skipping through that quite quickly. So apologies for people that ended up having that uh, not work. If I try that again, I think that I'm, the only slight problem with me trying it again, if I delete it and try it again from scratch, then maybe we'll do that. I'll just let everyone else who has something else they want to ask get that opportunity first though, before, because essentially I think we're now running off time. Um, Megan hasn't said that there's a problem with this and Zoom hasn't closed the meeting. So I'm assuming that as Zoom should, it shouldn't mind with the fact that we're still going. And of course this will also go into the recording because we're still recording as well. Um, okay, but there's no, there's no waving hands or urgent requests. Uh, okay, good. Okay, so apologies for those who need to leave. I mean, that makes perfect sense. I need to leave and get some lunch before we go on the singularity containers anyway. Let me just quickly then try to recreate that example in the Bitbucket context. But as I said, keep in mind that it's a weird example. Okay, I'm really just showing you that Bitbucket can end up running a container that you push to the Docker Hub on their servers. That's essentially the kind of sum total of what I'm showing there. I don't actually expect that what I'm demonstrating would be particularly useful to you uh, in terms of a real process. There are better ways to do continuous integration. Um, and I might, I might allude to that actually in terms of showing one other point. But Megan, you're on video. Does that mean you want to make an announcement? Oh, no, I was just showing my faces to say that I was here because you called you were you mentioned uh, wrapping up a second ago, and yeah, I just yep. wanted to say that um, if you guys have to go grab some lunch, uh, you're welcome, and I'll meet some of you back at one thirty for the Singularity workshop. And that includes me as well, but I won't be trying to have my face in the way of the presenters. Uh, Blair can have have his face in in the video slot, but I will be in the background there, kind of having a look. So let me quickly just show two other things. I'll try to rerun that um, Bitbucket example just so you can see it work. Or alternatively, I'll end up demonstrating that I can't rerun it because I've failed. But I'll also just show you one quick point about a way in which continuous integration can be used more usefully. Again, this is going to come fairly fast, uh, but you can read up more detail on this if you want to know more. I will show you how um, I will show you how we have, um, oh good, okay, so the player's correcting me. There's lots of people who will be on, on display in terms of the camera for the Singularity session this afternoon. Uh, let me go to the Docker Hub and I'll show you an example of how the LaTeX container that I use for building LaTeX documents uh, is actually constructed. So we're on the Docker Hub now. Let's have a look at the LaTeX builder. So I'll click on LaTeX Builder. 
this is an image that you can use. I mean, feel free. I'm, 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 not, I'm not vouching for its quality particularly. I mean, it's something which I use this in continuous integration. So for example, the papers that I teach, that web paper, it has a lab book that's a PDF, all of the specifications that makes up that lab book, we have stored as latex source code in a Git repository. Whenever anyone pushes to the master branch of that Git repository, it automatically rebuilds the PDF, which means that students can just reload. You know, they can use one constant link and that gives them access to the most recent um, version of the lab book, which is on the master branch. So that's an example of where I use it. And that's my excuse for not having a decent uh, readme file because this really doesn't have a decent readme file. So I apologize for that. But yeah, this is mostly one I typically use myself. How does it work? How does this actually get built? It turns out that I'm using a facility that Docker, the Docker Hub provides to actually run your Docker files on its servers. So that's an example again of continuous integration being very useful here. And it's, it's sort of, more useful than the Bitbucket example, although I will try to reshow that as well. So what's going on? If we actually have a look at the tags uh, tab on this LaTeX builder, we see that this is the wrong tab. What I wanted was the builds tab. If we click on the builds tab, it's probably also the wrong tab, but let me have a go. The builds tab shows when this particular image was rebuilt. And they mean build in the sense of the docker build command that we ran. But here, docker are running that command for us. So if we look down here, I'm actually on this system using what's called an automated build. So that means that I have the docker file that specifies how to make my image. I have that stored on GitHub. When I change that GitHub repository to change what's in that docker file, the Docker Hub notices and automatically rebuilds my image by running essentially the Docker build command for me on their servers. And then that updates the publicly available image that you can use. So again, I mean, it's sensationally useful and very valuable. Docker did change their terms of service recently to indicate that they'd noticed that that accumulated at least sort of, I think that it accumulated something in the order of four petabytes of craft that they didn't really want to keep paying to host. So they've now changed their system to mean that containers that, uh, sorry, container images that don't get accessed at all for a period of, you know, I can't remember, 12 months or something like that, now will be automatically removed because they're trying to kind of not just become a storage dumping ground for you know, all the examples where like in my case, I might've run one of these containers once five years ago. And in fact, I never intend to run it again. So why should Docker Hub have to actually keep storing that content? That's what Docker Hub are doing. So here you see, and in fact, I actually turned off the automatic building on this case because I was doing some tweaking that meant I was gonna break things otherwise. But what you find is that um, this repository, if I just show you this link here, this repository is the place that the Docker files are actually contained that are the things that build my LaTeX builder. So I've not actually run the LaTeX, I've not actually done Docker build on my own LaTeX builder for years. I think I did it once or twice to test. Now I don't have to, I can just let the Docker hub do that for me. And they will actually, that will actually run all of the construction steps to make this, um, this particular Docker image. So if we click on that, that will take us to the repository that contains the Docker file. And you see here that this is just a repository I have on, on GitHub that contains things like this LaTeX builder folder. If we look in there, uh, I organized it slightly better than it was before so that now it indicates the thing that I'm calling the latest tag is contained in here. And I click on that and we can view this, the Docker file through the web. So not exactly a comprehensive uh, example, here, actually, the reason is because the LaTeX builder image builds on top of one of my other images. So in this case, it just uses the DME LaTeX um, named Docker file, and then it just adds a few extra commands in. Uh, in particular, it adds the curl command, which is a way of accessing websites from the command line, which was I, I needed for a reason. So I'm gonna click back to the top level of this Docker file and instead show the LaTeX repository, which is a little bit more interesting, and the latest version of that and its Docker file. And this at least shows it installing LaTeX. So all I've said in my Docker file to get my system that can build these LaTeX documents usefully for me is that I'm using Debian Linux. I'm using a cut down version of Debian Linux of a particular version. Uh, and in this case, I've actually locked the version so that I can say that my latest tagged 
LaTeX builder, or LaTeX in this case, image is a particular version of Debian Linux, whereas before I just let it sort of sit. Actually, no, I'd always had, it, always had a particular version of Linux there. And the run command, there's a single run command that achieves everything that I need to have happen here. It updates the package repository for Debian and then installs some stuff. It installs that particular command, LaTeX make, uh, the make command, and then tech live, which is all of LaTeX. That's a sort of one gigabyte or so worth of, or multiple gigabytes worth of stuff. It installs those packages and then it removes some content so that some leftover caching material isn't wrapped up in the image when it doesn't need to be. So this minimizes the image size very slightly and it's the type of thing that's covered in the best practice documents that Docker will give you. So this is an example where unlike what we work through today, uh, my more common way of working with Docker files now is to actually just push them up into the cloud and have some other cloud server, be it the Docker Hub or whatever, actually use and build my images for me. Uh, so I, I find that really quite, quite interesting as a paradigm shift. It means that I can create code and have the code run where the only tool that I've used is a web browser. Now, there was absolutely no, I don't even need to have LaTeX installed on my own computer to make all of this work. This is a, the surreal point in this example is I don't even need to have Docker installed on my computer to have it usefully work because I'm not running the containers on my own computer. I'm running them on some other cloud server to do useful work on my behalf. Anyway, that's my pitching for how the cloud is interesting. Let's go back to Bitbucket and see if I can reproduce something there. Uh, okay, first, step one, find the right tab to use. I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna delete this repository and try to create it again. Uh, and hopefully then you can, you can jump in at the step that's useful for you. Bitbucket home. So now the use Alpine Python repository is going to be the one which Bitbucket gets to see being created and destroyed in a, apparently mysterious um, sequence of actions. Repository settings for that one, and I'm just deleting what I had there before. It took me quite a long time to find the delete was buried up here in this little bot menu because they don't want to make delete repository a, a, an easy to find thing. I've now deleted that. Okay, so we're gonna go and create a repository. Uh, you can click on create repository in the main page here. Uh, or indeed, you could use that link there. Uh, I suggested in the instructions to use the plus sign, which pops up this little window, uh, this sort of pop-up page here. And in this case, I've said I wanted to create a repository. Um, I mean, really, I'm only using the repository to get access to it running the pipeline, which is how it then downloads and runs things from our Docker container. And as I said, this is an unusual way to use the whole system. So uh, it's, it's important just to, um, Keep that in mind. I mean, this, this is not a workflow that's likely to be very useful to you. It's close to workflows that might be useful to you, uh, but you probably want to read through the documentation of what you want to do more specifically. And again, if you maybe later today or at any time, if you want to email me, suggest the type of thing you'd like to achieve, I maybe have to point you in the direction of tools that would do that well. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh yeah, sure. Okay, that's um, not a problem. Yes, very good. So. Uh, I will wrap up reasonably soon. I'll click on repository because I'm hovering over that. And this brings up the Bitbucket interface asking me to fill in some details. I need to fill in those top two details and then I'll need to give it one other piece of information. So selecting a workspace, I see this. I don't know what you see. You may have to create a workspace. I mean, un unfortunately, I can't see what you see unless you share your screen and there's a problem. So I said, I think this workflow is actually slightly too strange to me that I worry too much about it. If it doesn't work, I would probably just throw it away. Uh, and, and then you can read through a, a, a more solid use case that might suit your needs better. Selecting a project, again, I don't know quite what you see. Create new project would work, I think, but I've just chosen an untitled project. This is just a new way that Bitbucket groups together work that I'm not using, hence the fact I'm using an untitled project. And this is where I gave a name, like we want to use our container and we made Alpine Python. And that is, um, you know, the, the, it doesn't matter what that name is, I, it's going to be what Bitbucket knows that repository by. Uh, but I'm su suggesting to myself that this is a hint that I'm going to um, have this be the place that I'm going to use the Alpine Python Docker container image that we created and that has been pushed to the Docker Hub. And in my case, that's in, in my DME 26 slash Alpine hyphen Python. 
and I'm going to accept the existing um, settings there and just go create repository. Um, right there. And we will go into, um, so I was getting a phone call as well, which I'm going to ignore, but I am waiting for my phone to stop the strange buzzing sensation in my pocket. That's good, missed call. Uh, so here, pipelines is what I clicked on here. Exactly what comes up in the user interface might be a bit um, different for different users here. For me, I see this big page where I think if you scroll down, yeah, if you scroll down the page, you can get to the part that actually matters. Uh, or you can click on the start using pipelines, which does the same thing. So nothing comes up. Yeah, interesting. Okay. So you've clicked on this pipelines link here. Ah, right. So when you say nothing comes up, um, what form of nothing? As in literally uh, just a blank page. So that doesn't sound like what's supposed to happen. I mean, particularly given that I would assume that in Bitbucket, uh, that even if something was broken, it should give an error page rather than giving a blank page. Blank page with pipelines highlighted. Yeah, how interesting. I wonder if I can, if I keep, keep clicking that. Ah, oh, right, okay. Well, this actually may have to do with one fact which I'd not considered. Um, it may be, you see, it says here, my current plan includes 500 free minutes per month. Ages ago, I signed up to Bitbucket uh, and, and organized myself to have an academic user account, like an educational account. And I think that, that, that it's possible that they don't give away. No, I don't think that's right. Because I think actually the plans, even the free plan for everyone includes three minutes per month. So I think in that case, I'm afraid, I think it's probably just something that's gone broken with Bitbucket and that the account that's being created, 50 minutes a month. Okay, isn't that interesting? Okay, right, so there you go. So if you can justify a university connection or some other kind of, I guess, um, also hopefully government connection, then that's the reason I see 500 rather than 50. Yeah, another browser, that's a good suggestion. So I'm just using Safari, which normally breaks things. So um, <laughs> normally Safari isn't the browser of choice when it comes to wanting portability, um, but it could be that that's actually a browser problem. Certainly this kind of page with the sort of slightly mysteriously unnecessary scrolling thing that sort of half works, that it could be just that that's broken um, as opposed to the actual uh, pipeline system. I oh, know the 50 minutes is a different point. So 50 minutes is I'm getting 500 minutes because I have signed up to have an academic account. So that just verifies that I have a university address. And then that gives me some extra credit as a consequence, I believe. I mean, I did that probably like seven years ago. So I, I have no idea what's happened in the meantime with respect to how my plan has rolled forwards. But if you're in Chrome, do you get the rest of this page appearing, Roy, is this actually working? You see something similar to what I'm sharing. Okay, sure. So I think that that means 50 minutes is fine. That just means you've got less free time per month. And it means I need to change what I'm saying because it means you need to kind of academicalize your account uh, or have a student account to get those larger number of minutes. But I will keep, if, if I'm afraid, I think Jade, I may not be able to help unless you can try um, the other browser. Do you want, I'll just wait for a sec to see whether, yeah, cool, that's fine. Um, so fingers crossed that that's all good because then if it does work for you, I can continue to step through the instructions as opposed to just kind of rudely leaving you behind and saying, right, I'm showing Roy and off we go. Um, so we'll wait for Firefox to open up and install updates or whatever it wants to do. Actually, that's, that's too rude. Nowadays, the browsers are extremely good at installing updates in a way that doesn't get in the way. Oh yeah, no, that's something I can't help with. And yeah, um, but there's no pressure because uh, you know, we will probably need to stop in the next sort of 10 minutes just for the sake of making sure there's a clear divide on the recording for the um, screencast. And also because if I don't eat some lunch, I might end up uh, just fading away. So, oh, a quick summary of what was happening. Oh, okay. Um, the, yeah, I mean, I'll show you the actual YAML example again. 
what this is saying is that you can set up this particular repository so that whenever a push occurs, so like whenever an update occurs to that repository, an action gets triggered. In fact, the an action gets triggered is a coincidentally good choice of words because the continuous integration system under GitHub is called GitHub Actions, and that's what they mean. The GitHub Actions are actions that occur, you know, a computational thing happens as a consequence of committing to that repository. And so here, what's going to happen is every time a commit is made to this particular repository, then whatever is contained in this pipeline description, which is admittedly just a particular syntax for describing, you know, how pipelines work on, um, on Bitbucket, but whenever a commit is made to this Git repository, this pipeline system, oh good, okay, so Firefox works, right, well that, that's good to know. What was, well I don't know what the other browser was, but it's good, it's interesting to know which ones do and don't work. Making browsers work, work across the board has is, is always been a, a world of pain. Uh, I did some work as a webmaster back in the day of Internet Explorer version 6, which was a very, very special type of pain, kind of similar to Fortran in terms of its level of pain, probably, old Fortran code. So anyway, here, this is the description of what happens. Oh, Edge, okay, that should work, but um, anyway. Um, I think Chrome is probably fine too. Um, I guess it's a question of what Bitbucket are you using. <laughs> Presumably it's, I don't know, they're, they're, they're not using enough edge in their own development team to have noticed that their pipelines page doesn't work. The other thing here is of course that that pipeline splash page is only really kind of marketing um, the pipelines the very first time you see it on your account as soon as you've actually on that repository as soon as you're coming back to rerun it it doesn't show that splash page so a lot of other people probably just skip past that or don't notice that it's blank or some other way they manage to get beyond that point uh, and then they're not going to notice that that page is actually broken but so here is the example where what this is telling us to do this pipeline by default all of this stuff is just like you know like part of the syntax of what Bitbucket's continuous integration system needs doesn't matter so much for us, but what we're seeing here, that's a shell command. And the same, this is essentially a shell script where each one of these lines will run a particular shell command. The shell command runs inside a container instance, and the container instance that it runs inside um, is it comes from this particular image here. So by default, there's this de default image that Atlassian is suggesting as the owners of Bitbucket that could be used there, but we can replace that to be, for example, BME26 Alpine. I mean, you have to use your own username. What's on, you don't have to use your own username because of course this is a public image, so you're very welcome to use mine. In fact, if you do type DME26, it just means you'll download my one rather than downloading the one that you pushed uh, onto the Docker Hub. But we were talking about running um, Alpine, Python, is that the one we did before, maybe? I think it was. So we ran Alpine Python before, uh, and what this means is here, I'm just gonna write uh, a particular shell command. If we, um, we sort of know what we expected the Python version to be, uh, because of what we locked into our creation of the container, and it was an out of support old version of Python 2, is 2.7 point something, we should see then that when this script runs, on Bitbucket servers, we should see that version that's actually printed out here. So is it that okay, Roy, for me to click ahead, then I'll just click ahead on this one and we can just see it run again and I can just highlight what's happened in the execution. Um, yep, okay, all good. So we'll click that one and then what you see is, at least on browsers that support whatever fancy thing at last are trying to do, uh, it says you've set up pipelines and then normally it will automatically start showing you what's happening. So I haven't clicked anything, this is happening automatically. So the build setup is going to be downloading the container from the Docker Hub uh, and you know, does some other things that whiz past very quickly. In our case, this line here, the Python dash dash version was the line that we added into the scripting part. And if we click on that, we see what that command printed back, which was 2.7.18. Uh, and hoping that that matches what was installed in our particular image, this is not showing anything useful, but it is showing you that, it's not showing you useful work being done, but it's showing that you've now got the power to have your or my Docker Hub images be loaded onto Bitbucket's servers to run continuous integration jobs that might be useful. Good, so hopefully that covers that okay. And like I said, I'll be around later on, but I will probably, um, thanks. <laughs>
Oh, it's the new one. Yeah, of course, you know, of course, yeah, I was going to say with Edge, yeah, the, the, the one which is based on Chrome, that was the one I was thinking you might have meant, which that one I, which should definitely work. The one that not even Microsoft seemed to like anymore, that one I think has been a bit, um, it's been a bit unloved. So presumably it's also unloved by Atlassian, although I would have thought that their pages should work on it anyway. Um, but that's interesting to know. You can report that to them if you wish to hear whether or not um, they're responsive on that kind of fix. Good. So anyway, it's been very enjoyable for me to work through this material, not least since um, it was really quite amusing to have Alpine change yesterday and break all the examples, but Docker helped us solve that problem. So that's all good. And I will be online, but just in the background for the Singularity workshop this afternoon as well. But in the meantime, we'll grab some lunch. So I hope you've enjoyed this in some way. And uh, absolutely, if there are things we can improve that we can do better in future, please definitely get in contact uh, with Megan or myself, and we will happily absorb that, that feedback into the lessons as we go forwards. So great, I shall be off camera and we'll be on alongside you in the workshop this afternoon.